Okay, I call to order the Open Space Board of Trustees meeting of March 11th, 2020, and I just want to acknowledge the obvious that we meet under extraordinary circumstances, and we appreciate the fact that, you know, you have all come here at possibly at some risk to yourselves, and we take that as a reflection of how much these issues matter to you, and please know that they matter a great deal to us, and that we will give them, you know, the full seriousness that they deserve while at the same time trying to be as mindful of your time as we can so that we can all get out of here um, having done the best job we can with these issues. So we will try to be efficient um, and uh, I'm sure that will be true for all of us. Um, so the first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes we have two sets of minutes, the first from February 12th, 2020. I, I gave uh, Leah, Erica, and Megan a number of what are really just uh, typo-type changes. The one that I had that's a little more substantial that I just wanted to bring to people's attention is on page four, um, the third paragraph, Ray Bridge. Um, and the uh, third line, I'll skip the introductory part of it, yep. uh, he says, they interfere with agriculture to such a degree to maintain viable population. Uh, I checked with Ray, and that should say they interfere with agriculture to such a degree to threaten viable operation. I think that captures um, the, what Ray was trying to say there. I think everything else, at least that I that I had, was just you know typos and minor little word changes. Um, Karen, did you have something you wanted to add? Well, I do have a number of those kinds of things, but I don't know that I want to go through all of them. Um, change variable as human. Um, I, I was going to give them. Um, to the staff, but I forgot to do that. So, um, I don't know, should I go through and mention them, or? Are they just edits? They're, yeah, they're just edits. Well. Like, on page three, the fourth paragraph, the third line, should say, remove prairie. Yep. Yeah. Um, and on the next page, page four, Boulder obviously should be capitalized. Uh, you've taken care yep. of the one on Ray Bridge. Uh, Jim Howell, the last word should be not, I think, N-A-U-G-H-T. Um, and on the next page, page five, Sherry Seberg, the last word should be short-sighted, I think. S-I-G-H-T-E-D, yeah. yep. And and the word before prairie dogs, I think, is eradicate. Yep. That's it. Okay. Anything from anyone else? <coughs> and do we have a motion? I'll move to approve the minutes of February 12th as amended. I'll second. All in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Um, Likewise, I had a couple minor changes to the minutes of February 13th, but nothing substantive. Was that in the packet? Um, they were sent, separate. they were sent separately uh, online. Okay. If, if you want to read them, I'm happy to show you my hard copy if you want to read them over, but we can uh, take up the motion later. There's no, it's up to you. Has everybody else read them? Yeah, did any? I'm fine. Okay. Go ahead. Then do we have a motion? I'll move that we approve the minutes of February 13th, 2020 as amended. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? <coughs> I'm abstaining. Okay. So that's four with the, and Karen abstaining. All right. Uh, then the next item on the agenda is public comment for items not identified for a public hearing. Uh, the only, okay, so no one has signed up for that, which would be anything other than prairie dogs. And so I will then close public comment for items not identified for public hearing and turn to matters from the department. 
Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, we have purposely uh, cleared the decks for tonight. Uh, we're expecting a, uh, a long, uh, robust conversation tonight, so we have not put any under uh, any items under matters from the department. I just would like to note, though, um, that if any uh, if there was any clarifying or specific questions that possibly couldn't be addressed at a different time, this, uh, there are some staff members here that could ask ask. ask any or answer any questions that you may have for any written information because uh, we don't expect those staff po folks to be here later in the night if you have it out. So that would be the only thing I would pose at this at this time, but otherwise there's no matters from the department. All right, so if you have any questions particularly about the uh, Eldo Canyon State Park issue that you would not be able to just handle, you know, with ordinary offline emails to Casey or other staff members, uh, this would be a chance to, you know, kind of quickly touch base on that. And Tom, then I have one just slight. Um, so in just looking at the uh, board calendar for the upcoming months, um, we have a, a final staff meeting on Thursday in which we look more specifically, especially at the month to come. And we're expecting that there's going to be some adjustments forthcoming. So I just want to daylight those now to you. Um, um, we are expecting um, uh, April to change. Uh, the voice and site monitoring results um, is likely going to be later in the spring. Um, and we may have um, uh, some conversation need for some more uh, South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project discussion in April following the late March meeting. Nothing set in stone yet, but I just wanted to daylight it that uh, uh, for those who uh, out in the audience or on TV or here that follow these rolling calendars uh, to be on the lookout for some changes, especially in regards to April. So it could be both March 30th and April 8th is what you're saying? Yeah, March 30th doesn't change. That's going to be almost not a big part of South Boulder Creek flood. Uh, but we are expecting that there could be um, additional uh, discussion. Uh, we're not sure how robust or how narrow, but that uh, there could be some discussion again on April 8th. Thank you. Okay. Dan, is that it from matters from the department? That is it. Okay. Uh, oh, is, go ahead. Is there, is there any plan on either of those meetings to have any uh, board discussion about the Eldo Vump? Casey, do you want to maybe clarify when? I, I don't know if we quite know when the opportunity for public comment and, and feedback is, but I. Sure. Uh, Casey French, planner with Open Space in Mount Parks. Um, we have confirmed with CBW that right now the current thinking is, is that the public comment period, although we don't know the details, would overlap with the May OSBT meeting. So in that general, in that time frame, that those right. two would overlap. But those, those are all the details we know at this time. So we will put some, make sure we schedule time in for May. Um, if, that, if that ends up holding with the project schedule. Anything else? Okay. Uh, then we're on to Prairie Dogs. Great. I'm just going to let the uh, presentation come up. My name is Mark Gershman. I'm a planner with the <coughs> Open Space and Mountain Parks Department and the project manager for this project. Um, I'm here on behalf of the city staff team uh, responding to council's direction regarding an expedited public process for respond, uh, responding to problems associated with irrigated open space lands, generally north of J Road, that are occupied uh, by prairie dogs. The other members of the team that I'd like to acknowledge and who are here include uh, John Potter, who is our project sponsor and has um, been instrumental to bringing folks together and uh, leading us on this project as well as um, Heather Swanson, who's here in the front row, along with Val Matheson, our Urban Wildlife Conservation Coordinator, and Andy Pelster uh, here as well. Uh, Lauren Kolb, uh, our Soil Health Coordinator, is, is also here. And if there are other staff members who've been actively involved, I, I apologize. Allison Eklund's been helping us with community uh, coordination, and uh, Phil Yates has certainly been doing a 
Yeoman's work on uh, keeping the uh, communication lines flowing. Uh, but it's been a big project and has involved many members of the staff, and I'd like to acknowledge that. In addition to staff, I, I'd also like to uh, call out Karen Holwig and Dave Kuntz, who throughout the process has served as the board liaisons advising staff on process-related matters. Uh, the purpose of this evening's meeting is for staff to provide background on the project, the process, present the preferred alternative, and request that the Open Space Board of Trustees affirm the preferred alternative with or without modifications uh, through a recommendation um, to the board, by the board to city council. Um, I'm gonna take a moment to uh, recap uh, the issue and then our direction. Um, this, uh, this project emerged out of uh, a recognition by both the board and council that high levels uh, of prairie dogs uh, overlapping with irrigated fields have highlighted some of the policy conflicts or operational conflicts regarding how the city goes about um, managing prairie dogs when in conflict with other land uses, um, as well as uh, some of the policies associated with uh, conserving and um, sustaining our best opportunities for agriculture. Uh, furthermore, that these um, high levels of prairie dogs on irrigated fields have also resulted in difficulties for open space and mountain parks uh, to meet charter purposes, especially those charter purposes associated with agricultural service delivery to the community. And, and thirdly, that uh, through a combination of uh, factors that the occupancy by prairie dogs in these areas has contributed to soil degradation and loss, which has implications not only for grassland ecosystems and agricultural ecosystems, but also in terms of strategies that the city is interested in using soil as a means to sequester carbon as one of many implementation uh, strategies for reducing the climate crisis that we currently face. In, um, in looking at our practices of using um, relocation or non-lethal control through relocation, um, council and the board both determined that that alone would not be uh, likely be a timely or economical means uh, to address this issue. So consequently, uh, we received direction um, to examine the agricultural uses on our northern grasslands, which are largely ranching and farming. Uh, but there is also some diversified vegetable operations in those areas and some other smaller um, organic farming. Um, examine ecological conditions on the landscape, the health of the soils uh, and wildlife. And in, in considering those things, um, look at techniques to improve the situation that could include um, things like deep plowing or key lining, soil amendments to improve um, soil quality and soil health. Uh, lethal control of prairie dogs and other measures. And so that uh, is the direction that we received from council um, back in May of 2019. That direction was also folded into the Open Space and Mountain Parks Master Plan and appears um, in that master plan as um, uh, Tier 1 Strategy ATT3 address conflicts between agriculture and prairie dogs, which uh, goes on to describe, maintain the viability of agricultural operations by reducing impacts from prairie dogs on irrigated lands while supporting ecologically sustainable prairie dog populations across the larger landscape. I think it's important to put uh, our current actions, now that we have a master plan, in the context of our master plan as we bring them before the board uh, for that context. Of course, there's other related uh, master plan goals, but that would be the one most central to this project and was, was indeed included as a reflection of council's direction to staff. Now that's the full motion and oops, I don't know why that even happened. I'm sorry. Ah. Go back and try that again. <laughs> Okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, the uh, timeline for the project, uh, we began uh, providing uh, feedback uh, to the Open Space Board of Trustees back in August of last year um, with some preliminary ideas about how we might go about an exped expedited public process uh, for, for the purposes of this project. 
um, gave counsel some information about that and um, described a process by which we would have three uh, engagement windows. The first focused on uh, building a shared understanding, describing the situation, and building a shared understanding with the community of that situation. Uh, the second engagement window, which started at the beginning of this year, uh, was focused on uh, coming up with suggestions on how we might improve the situation. Um, and that included an evaluation of a number of management techniques as well as um, the initial recommendations of an approach. During that engagement window last month, we had a study session uh, with the Open Space uh, Board of Trustees that gave us additional guidance and um, some public hearing uh, during uh, the meeting preceding the study session. We're now at the, um, uh, just near the start of the third engagement window, which opened um, last week with the uh, distribution of the materials uh, for this study session. And uh, we'll go on through a public hearing currently scheduled with City Council on April 21st. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the, the engagement windows. Uh, as I said, the objective of the first engagement window was uh, for staff uh, to introduce and describe the situation as we uh, saw it. <coughs> through a community meeting um, or open house, online questionnaire, and then uh, kind of open-ended online input, uh, look for opportunities to gain a broader understanding of the situation through conversations with the community, um, and try to build a shared understanding because, um, as I think everyone in the room knows, there's a lot of differing views on this topic. So at least getting those perspectives out uh, so we could start to see how the things fit together as a, as a system and begin to ask some questions about what can we do to improve this situation. We had a, um, a fairly high level of engagement uh, during that first engagement window, as you can see detailed uh, in the bottom of the first uh, column there. Um, <clears throat> Having had some input and uh, in terms of, of what the situation was and getting some initial ideas, staff took that information um, and then developed the materials I described before, uh, evaluation of different management techniques and uh, some beginnings of, uh, of a uh, draft approach to how we might package these different um, implementation techniques together. Uh, and that, that information uh, was released at the beginning of January for public comment. Um, because of the expedited nature of the process, that was an online, um, an online engagement window uh, where we collected public comment largely through a questionnaire and um, public comment through emails. And we received about 600 people uh, participated in the questionnaire, about 300 of them, about half of them uh, completed the questionnaire uh, completely. Um, we had about 80 email responses, as, as you've seen, and the, many of those provided some very detailed information about people's experiences and ideas. We had lesser involvement through social media. And then last month, prior to the study session, uh, there were 36 speakers who came to share their ideas. So fairly robust level of information sharing um, and engagement by the community uh, through this process. Some of the things um, that we heard uh, about community values during the first engagement window uh, were that these things were, impor were important or are important to the community. That farming and ranching on open space and mountain parks is important for a number of reasons, including production of food um, and local food related issues. Um, the lives of individual animals, prairie dogs, um, uh, are of value to uh, community members that the land management goals of our neighbors, uh, which is somewhat out of the scope of the core of this project, uh, is something that is, is important to uh, community members and is certainly something that we've heard a great deal about. And we've sought to broaden our focus to address that to some degree. Um, that grassland soils and the role that they play in supporting not only agricultural systems, but ecological systems as well, uh, are important to the community and that the role of prairie dogs as a keystone species structuring uh, a significant uh, portion of the grassland ecosystem is also something uh, that is valued by the community. With regards to um, what would we do about our current situation, we certainly heard um, a, a, 
an agreement uh, by ma many members of the community that prairie dog colonies overlapping with irrigated agriculture or just prairie dog colonies and irrigated agriculture just aren't compatible in the same places at the same time. Some people um, recommended uh, appropriate response would be to curtail or remove agriculture from these irrigable lands. Other people suggested the opposite of removing prairie dogs from these areas. <coughs> We also heard a lot about lethal control, and I know the board has also heard a lot about lethal control through the, the communications directed uh, to the board specifically, where we heard a considerable uh, amount about uh, a desire to avoid the use of lethal control or not see that as an appropriate thing for the community to be engaged in doing. And I would say also many of the people who shared the idea that lethal control was necessary often prefaced their remarks saying that it wasn't something that they um, particularly savored the idea of having the community involved in, however, found it was necessary if we were to conserve our agricultural lands or the soils associated with them. We also heard um, that however prairie dogs are removed, that that needs to be combined with exclusion and restoration so that that removal doesn't have to be repeated that we should be looking to address neighbor concerns through our actions, and that the recommendations of the Prairie Dog Working Group uh, should be integrated with whatever recommendations staff makes here. We used the feedback uh, from the community, uh, the feedback at the study session from the board, uh, staff's experience uh, and expertise working with prairie dogs over the years, and consultation with agency partners such as Boulder County and Fish and Wildlife Service and Colorado um, Department of Park, uh, Division of Parks and Wildlife. In doing that, we uh, developed uh, five alternatives uh, to the status quo for consideration. We shared these as part of the study session, um, and these were based upon a status quo of what current funding uh, and staffing allow us to see that packages C and D represented their uh, greatest level of interest in seeing staff follow up. Uh, and th and th that recommendation was based largely upon consideration of a number of factors, uh, factors for which data were provided. These included uh, the <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the time lapse to 100% uh, removal of the prairie dogs on irrigated lands in the project area, uh, the number of prairie dogs relocated versus lethally controlled, the costs associated with staffing, uh, the costs associated with other expenses such as contracted services, barrier materials and supplies and installation, the cost of, of reclamation as well. And then also important consideration was the allocation of funding uh, from other departmental priorities. So those were the factors that were presented, and uh, that table appears uh, in the packet materials. I believe it's table four um, in your packet materials. Um, we um, it took this, the recommendations uh, of the board in the context of what we had heard from the community and, and developed a preferred alternative based largely based largely on uh, package C. In consideration the balance of community comment, um, package C, which included uh, a component of relocation, felt like more uh, of a consistent uh, pathway from existing city practices, um, allowed us to address what we heard as a significant uh, number of community members who felt that including relocation as a strategy was an important part of our approach as a community towards uh, addressing this issue. We also focused on Alternative C because it represented a, um, a, a better starting point uh, from our perspective in that it didn't uh, suggest that we were gonna go from uh, a, a small or relatively small amount of lethal control to a, a vast amount of lethal control, both difficult uh, potentially operationally for the department, as well as representing a significant change for the community. Also, considering the feedback from the board and community, 
implementation at higher levels would require additional funding concentration on this issue, uh, which would narrow our ability to approach uh, or um, address other priorities as identified in the Open Space and Mountain Parks Master Plan and uh, other programmatic priorities. So uh, we felt it overall represented a strong balance. Uh, we did our um, we did our best to make uh, adjustments to it to uh, improve it and provide uh, stronger information in order to package uh, the preferred alternative so that we had Im information and consideration for uh, conserving agriculture, for uh, conserving prairie dogs, and for conserving the fundamental uh, role of soil. The uh, preferred alternative that was presented uh, as attachment B in the packet includes these five sections, uh, findings, uh, which was a suggestion uh, of one of the board members, which we found to be very useful as a way for us to um, build the case as, as if it were um, a resolution in, in a way of saying, you know, whereas we, we kind of feel that, uh, that these things are factual information or these are conclusions that we've inferred from data that have been collected um, or various findings that we were able to make um, to establish what, what we felt represented an understanding that could be conveyed to the board and to the community. We also articulated a number of assumptions uh, that were at play because there is uncertainty and uh, we, don't, we don't pretend to know how everything is going to, to go. And the assumptions uh, reflected uh, the feedback from the Open Space Board of Trustees during the February study session. Then there were 11 core um, preferred alternative actions uh, that were described in the document uh, along with uh, a set of prioritization uh, criteria that would help us uh, implement this over time across the approximately 916 uh, acres uh, affected in the uh, project area because we know that we wouldn't be able to do it all at once. And, um, and finally, uh, some information on uh, how we would go about implementing this and the associated costs. I think it's important to say that the preferred alternative actions also uh, included reference and context to other actions undertaken by the city uh, through the urban wildlife program, through the city's implementation of the grassland plan uh, and the agricultural resources management plan to help put these things in context that we're not just doing any one thing, but that uh, these recommendations come in the context of a much broader suite of action. <clears throat> I, um, I wanted to uh, take a moment uh, to highlight some of the key findings uh, from the document uh, because uh, to some degree these reiterate some of the direction we received from council, but I think that uh, we were able to document uh, the data, the facts and figures associated with our land system to support these. Uh, one thing I think is uh, very important to stress here is that although the uh, city charter provides us general language on how to go about uh, or what we are here to go about doing in terms of providing services for the community and what the purposes for open space are, it's largely through the development of plans and um, work plans that we bring those things to bear uh, on the ground and, and make those things happen or take that vision in the charter and, and make it real. And so one of the things that we did through the both the uh, grassland plan and the agri agricultural resources uh, management plan was evaluate where the best opportunities uh, lay for a number of the services that our grasslands provide. provide. And we found that uh, the irrigable lands are the best opportunities um, on open space and mountain parks to fulfill the charter uh, purposes for uh, agriculture. Um, and uh, more recently, as we look at this, to uh, enhance carbon sequestration of soils on open space and master, uh, mountain parks lands, excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, and this is largely due to the fact that these lands have been uh, disturbed uh, typically in the past. They may have been tilled or plowed. Uh, they've been replanted to pasture grasses often. And these provide us unique opportunities to uh, enhance carbon sequestration without necessarily disturbing native grasslands or uh, breaking native sod. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the other, the other uh, point that I think is important to make with regards to agricultural findings 
has to do with the purposes of open space, not just associated with agriculture, but also with um, disciplining growth and reigning in sprawl in the area. Uh, for um, the history of the open space program, the policy of acquiring both land and water um, was to achieve those objectives and to foster a situation where the Boulder Valley had open space rather than uh, increasing urban areas. And by acquiring land and the associated water, that water was not available to um, support municipal growth for Boulder or um, our neighboring communities. However, when you acquire water and land together, it's necessary uh, for that water to be used beneficially. Um, and the beneficial use for which most of the water that we have acquired um, is uh, designated is for agricultural use. Even early in the history of the open space program, uh, we had very few staff largely uh, involved in the acquisition of open space. And these staff, um, didn't have the ability necessarily to go out and run water on the properties. So the strategy was to lease these areas for agricultural production uh, to farmers and ranchers for largely irrigated pastures and hay fields. And so when the decision was made to acquire the lands for the variety of purposes they were acquired, one of the parts of the deal was that we would have to use them agriculturally. An agricultural lease had the added benefit of not only having somebody else run the water, but provide some revenues uh, back to the city uh, from that uh, agricultural tenant. So it was somewhat of an elegant and winning strategy to accomplish a lot of open space purposes. And so that is how we have largely managed those kinds of lands. And right now, we have not found as elegant an alternative to that um, and we do not have other lands that provide the same value for agricultural purposes. With regards to ecological findings, uh, an important thing uh, to um, clarify is that through um, a long series of plans, most recently the grassland plan adopted um, or recommended by the board and accepted by council in 2011, the Open Space and Mountain Parks Department is a leader in the front range uh, and perhaps in Colorado and, and perhaps throughout the range of the blacktail prairie dog in terms of dedicating lands uh, for the conservation of the blacktail prairie dog and associated species. At this point, we have about 5,000 acres uh, that have uh, management designations that are uh, focused or include the conservation of blacktail prairie dogs uh, and the associated species for that. In addition, we've established a number of specific and measurable management objectives uh, for prairie dogs and associated species to ensure that they continue to be an important part of our grasslands, contributing um, a number of values for biodiversity, um, to ecological systems in the soil, uh, to, to a wide range of factors. Um, and we do that by designating areas apart from irrigated agriculture for that purpose, largely, I should say. Um, with regards to conflict, one of the findings that I wanted to call out um, is that we've heard uh, from some folks that says, well, you could just have prairie dogs and agriculture, irrigated agriculture in the same place. We had been very successful, I would say, in having prairie dogs and um, rangeland uses, upland grazing by livestock in the same place, but we don't believe uh, that it's possible uh, to have irrigated lands with high levels of prairie dog occupancy because, <coughs> excuse me, not only are these lands no longer suitable um, for irrigation and growing of uh, crops on these lands, um, but the techniques that we would be using to enhance soil uh, carbon sequestration would also be frustrated by the natural activities of prairie dogs as they forage and burrow. And then uh, lastly, with regards to prairie dog removal, um, at our current uh, staffing and funding levels, um, relocation of prairie dogs will not allow us um, to remove um, the prairie dogs uh, from the irrigated agricultural lands in the project area. 
uh, in a timely fashion. And uh, we've estimated it could take uh, several decades, up to 40 years, uh, to affect that kind of relocation. Uh, and, uh, and that's um, a, a very long time. And one of the things we would be concerned of is that we've already lost agricultural tenants, uh, a, an agricultural tenant, and we've had lands removed from agricultural production uh, as a result of what has been a recent prolonged uh, period of high prairie dog occupancy. So those uh, are the key findings um, that I just wanted to highlight as part of the preferred um, alternative. I, I won't go through the preferred alternative actions in detail. Um, they, they appear in the board packet, uh, uh, in the attachment B. Um, this is the heart of staff's recommendations. Um, it includes what we think are a distribution of uh, strategies intended to allow us to communicate uh, with our stakeholders uh, from a variety of perspectives to inform what we are doing, to gather new ideas uh, from our agency partners and other stakeholders about how we could improve the situation. We feel that the combination of relocation, removal through lethal control, barrier construction, and restoration will address our goals of restoring our agricultural lands to production and allow us to retain our agricultural tenants on these lands. Uh, we also feel that the removal of prairie dogs from these areas will provide us with an enhanced opportunity to improve soil conditions and uh, improve our ability to use those soils to sequest sequester carbon. We suspect it may be necessary to seek uh, appro appropriate changes uh, through um, the city attorney's office and the planning department uh, on rule changes associated with the wildlife protection ordinance uh, potentially employ the special use provisions of the ordinance uh, and potentially uh, seek particular code changes. In addition, we feel that in recognition of uh, the undesirability of lethal control to the community, and uh, I, I can certainly say nobody signs up to work for open space um, for the purposes of uh, using lethal controls, trying to find a way to um, mitigate the impacts, just like uh, if an activity were to impact wetlands or some other valued natural resource uh, to compensate for those impacts through the um, designation of a contribution, a per acre contribution to the Grassland Conservation Fund, which is uh, something that's anticipated uh, by both the Prairie Dog Working Group and the Wetlands Protection Ordinance. Um, we have uh, taken the, the uh, prioritization criteria presented at the study session um, and uh, wanted to clarify a couple of things about this, that um, our initial focus uh, moving forward with the removal of prairie dogs would be removal of prairie dogs from transition and removal areas per the grassland plan. These are places that the grassland plan determined would not be appropriate for the occupation of prairie dogs so that we could achieve other uh, grassland plan goals, uh, in this case, uh, the conservation of sustainable agricultural operations. Uh, we also, based upon the feedback from the community and the board, uh, will work in those areas where we think we have the highest uh, likelihood of success. Um, those two things taken together um, will lead us uh, to addressing um, the agricultural tenants who are most affected by uh, the overlap of prairie dogs with irrigated uh, agricultural lands, uh, largely because we've already started to take some effort in those areas, and that confers uh, a higher likelihood of success, and those areas are transition and removal areas as well. Uh, the other prioritization criteria flow from there, and they're also included in the packet materials, and uh, because I've talked a lot so far, I'm not going to go through those in detail as well. This is a picture of just the first three-year estimates of uh, some of the important associated factors. Um, we anticipate um, by 2022 uh, capability of removing uh, about uh, 300 acres. Uh, that would include about 3,500 acres of prairie dogs relocated, um, about uh, 5,500 animals lethally controlled, 
Uh, the non-staff cost associated for this for relocation, barriers, and restoration is about $1.3 million, an additional cost of staff time of $800,000, bringing the total cost up to about $2.1 million. This would necessitate the reallocation of approximately $600,000 over that time period from other departmental priorities for this project under uh, the preferred alternative. Um, the next steps uh, from this point, uh, with what recommendation we get from the Open Space Board of Trustees, uh, we will advance that to the City Council on April 21st. I will come back with a written update to the Board on what Action Council takes. And then in the fall of 2020, we will integrate our implementation uh, of whatever action is recommended by Council uh, into the annual update uh, that was a commitment through the Prairie Dog Working Group. Um, so, with that, um, the action that staff would like to request of the board tonight is uh, for the Open Space Board of Trustees to uh, make a motion to recommend that Council approve the preferred alternative for the management of irrigated agricultural fields on city managed open space and mountain parks lands occupied by prairie dogs in the project area as described in Figure 1 of the packet materials. Thanks. Well, th thank you, Mark, and thank you to all staff, both inside and outside of the Open Space Department, both for the presentation and for the enormous amount of work that's been done in the 10 months since we kicked off this process last April. And thanks in advance for the considerable amount of work you're probably going to be doing uh, between over the next six weeks between now and the City Council meeting on April 21st. Um, so but we obviously have a significant audience here, and before we go to public comment, I just want to check to see if there are any clarifying questions, and I'd encourage us to be, you know, especially narrow in what really we need to ask by way of clarifying questions, both because there's a lot of people waiting and because, you know, we've been at this for quite a long while. But if there's something you truly need to have clarified just to understand what the proposal is and maybe to help frame the public comment, you know, go ahead. Um, Kurt. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mark and uh, John, who has had the luck to have this and South Boulder and the CU South and all that fall and was played all at the same time. Um, so thank you. Uh, you're describing three years in the packet, but I assume what you're asking us to endorse is a program that will continue at that level of resources until it's accomplished its conclusion. Is that sort of what you're saying? Or are you saying, no, it's three years and then we're going to look at this again? What, what's your take? Um, <clears throat> John Potter, uh, Kirk, that uh, the, we, we use the three-year period to do the cost estimating to give you a sense of what that would look like. But the intention was that we, we would likely get, if you approve this uh, proposal, we, we would get some experience doing this and more than likely would have to come back to you after a, a year or two years and, and, and share with you what we've learned and what it looks like and then make decisions about moving forward. But generally, yes, um, we were just using that three-year period to, to cost the project, not to, um, to show the whole, the whole time frame. So. Thank you. Dave? Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, that was very helpful. The, the one qu quick question I have, I'm, I'm a little perplexed um, because the study session conversation we had, we asked that uh, both option C and D be evaluated and presented, and I understand the basis for staff's, um, you know, selection of C, but I'm uh, wondering, uh, I, I still think it would be very valuable to have, uh, you know, at least some analysis of D. Part of the, the board's approach, I think, was to be able to see the context of both, you know, using relocation and lethal control as opposed to just lethal control. So that would be part of, uh, you know, the community conversation. So I'm, I, I'm just a, I'm just a little concerned that uh, and, unless you tell me differently that we uh, we don't have that kind of comparative uh, opportunity. We um, thanks, Dave, and and you're right. We didn't do a, a detailed um, 
explanation, or a, we didn't do a detailed um, workup of uh, Alternative D for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the, the, the reasons that I mentioned before as, as a staff recommendation, and two, the, we had a relatively limited amount of time between um, the study session and uh, when the materials were due for, for today's uh, presentation and pulling together the data uh, for this alternative was relatively challenging. However, you will see on, um, on table four, oh, sorry, table five, um, on page 13 of the uh, agenda item that we did follow the uh, feedback we received during the study session uh, trying to clarify information and make it comparable amongst all the alternatives uh, for um, uh, the chart and the materials that were provided in a slightly different, less developed format at the study session. And uh, this is probably the best way to get a feel for what all the other alternatives uh, would look like uh, compared uh, to the um, preferred alternative presented. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you both very much for the presentation. Um, my, my understanding, the Grassland uh, Conservation Fund, this is essentially a restricted allocation of OSMP budget with what particular strictures associated with it? I can say at this point it's uh, an initial idea. The, uh, the idea being described as something where these funds would be used to advance um, the Prairie Dog Working Group recommendations, uh, to advance other initiatives in the grassland plan, and potentially uh, the urban wildlife <coughs> management plan to conserve um, prairie dogs uh, and associated species and their habitats. We haven't uh, played it out or fully developed the idea much beyond much beyond that. So, so it is all specifically prairie dog related? Yes, that was the idea, yep. Can you, can you say just a little bit more about it? As I read the description at the bottom of page 27, it sounded to me like OSMP was going to put money into the city's planning department budget to be able to take it back out to do some prairie dog work. And I'm sure that's not what you're trying to describe, because that sounds just very convoluted. This was, um, this was an idea that the Prairie Dog Working Group came up with in their recommendations, which the board recommended to council and council accepted. We um, had it scheduled to be worked on out in the future, but um, due, uh, based on sort of some of the feedback that we got, uh, from you about integrating the work of prairie dog conservation with what we were recommending here, we um, brought this this for this idea forward as an idea to consider. But the yes, the intention is that uh, funding could be used uh, to mitigate for areas where we're doing lethal control and provide additional prairie dog conservation, whether it be on our lands or other areas that the, uh, that the urban wildlife coordinator felt was um, going to contribute to prairie dog conservation overall. Um, that was sort of the intent of the Prairie Dog Working Group recommendation. But w we are open to your thoughts on this, and if you want to do something different here or not do this at all, um, that's that's totally up to you. Yeah, and, 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 Karen, and it is it is OSMP money that's going into this. That that is the proposal. Okay. Yeah, and so some of the things to work out is uh, uh, proper use of open space funds. And so whatever structure we come up with, we have to run through those scenarios to make sure that we can use open space funds in those ways. So as John was alluding to, it's a concept. We felt before we delved into a whole bunch of details, we first want to see is it something that is supported. And certainly we could, as we learn more and develop more, we could come back to you with more of the specifics on that concept. Thank you. Anything else or are we ready to go to the public? Okay. All right, so, uh, since uh, a number of you, this may be your first time uh, speaking before us, I'll quickly go over the ground rules. I'll call 
several names at once, recognizing some of you want to keep your distance from each other, but please either come down or come to the side so that when your name is called, you can fairly quickly uh, move to the podium and don't have to still make your way down from your seat. Um, when it, it's your time to speak, please give us your name and your address. Uh, given the large number of people who've signed up, you'll have two minutes to speak or three if you've pooled with someone who's present here. Um, as I said last time, two minutes goes by incredibly quickly. Please don't feel any obligation to engage in sort of pleasantries or thanks or praise or anything like that. We really want to hear the substance of what you have to say and um, you'll, it'll probably take you all of your two minutes to, uh, to do that. Um, the way the lights work, uh, when the yellow light comes on, it means you have 30 seconds left and when the red light comes on, it means your time is up, and at that point we would ask you to <coughs> wrap up as quickly as you can. And um, as with all City of Boulder meetings, uh, please don't cheer, boo, snicker, or give any other sort of audible reaction to the comments of anyone. This is a, as safe a space as we can make it, and we want everyone uh, to be able to express what we know are going to be some fairly uh, widely divergent opinions. So, um, with that, uh, the first several people are uh, Molly Davis, then Christine Pasoka, David Hester, and then Ben Valley. So, Molly Davis. Molly Davis, speaking for first preserving the vision.org. I'm a Boulder resident. I want to speak about relocation and Delta dust. Delta dust is not recommended for areas around watersheds. Delta dust is not recommended for areas of high winds. In the south and the north, we have extremely high winds. Delta dust is not recommended for areas with steep slopes. We're dealing with that with Demnovich on a lot of Dawson, on a lot of these areas. They run into our reservoirs, our irrigation canals. Here's the Delta dust label. If you look closely at the label, it cautions you all kinds of things. It says, do not contaminate water, food, storage. Be careful of this special <coughs> application concerns. Introducing the material into the air is a big problem. This is Delta Dust own material handling instructions. Look carefully under three, extremely toxic to fish and aquatic invertebrates. I was part of the committee that brought forth the new vote. I don't think I want to bring into perpetuity our problems with our water. If, as former trustee, I take fiduciary responsibility <coughs> very seriously. Who's going to pay for this? Thank you, Molly. Uh, Christine? My name is Christine Pasoka, and I live at 10824 North 65th Street in Longmont, which is a little too close to the city of Boulder open space property known as the Oasis. Um, over the past 13 to 14 years, I've written letters, spoken at meetings, and talked to individuals you regarding the, the mic down. regarding the poor uh, maintenance and unneighborly manner in which this property is managed. <clears throat> You have heard from myself and many others the frustration, time, and financial burdens <clears throat> that neighbors and farmers deal with trying to keep our properties productive. I am an animal lover. I have horses, a dog. I value their well-being, and I especially value my grandchildren's health and wellness <clears throat> as they spend a lot of time at our home. I'm a retired nurse of 35 years, so health and wellness has been a long-time focus of mine. 
I have a friend who several years ago, when the prairie dog plague was raging, um, was extremely sick. Um, it was traced to her cat, which had um, been catching prairie dogs, and she was actually in a coma for 11 days. These prairie dogs are not worth the costs incurred, and especially financially and especially health-wise. My friend's recent comment to me was, if Boulder wants to maintain prairie dogs in neighborhood areas, then I hope they are testing and treating for fleas which carry Yersinia pestis, the organism that causes the plague. Um, I feel that lethal control to manage this out-of-control prairie dog situation on city-owned property needs to start now. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, David Hester, then Ben Valley, Raymond Bridge, and April Story. My name is David Hester, and the Hester family currently owns 12 acres of land at 3505 Nebo Road that is zoned for agricultural use by Boulder County. During the February 12th Boulder Open Space Public Meeting, one of the community members referenced that the Boulder Open Space lands hosting prairie dog colonies were an urban environment. Based on housing unit densities, we classify developed land into urban, suburban, exurban, and rural land use categories. For the Boulder Hester Open Space property at 3517 Nebo Road, these City of Boulder lands are outside Boulder corporate limits and thus should be subject to the Boulder County Land Use Code zoning and permitted land uses. If you review the Boulder County Assessor's Property Records Database, 3517 Nebo Road is zoned as an agricultural district. Permitted land uses for land zoned as agriculture by Boulder County does not include hosting prairie dog colonies as a permitted use. According to the Boulder County Land Use Code, Article 4, a zoning ordinance imposes such reasonable limitations upon the right of a property owner to use their property as they please, but they may not use their property without regard for their neighbors or the effect of their actions upon the welfare and prosperity of the whole community of which they are a part. As a property owner in unincorporated Boulder County, Boulder open space lands outside corporate limits, which are zoned for agricultural use, need to comply with the same Boulder County land use, zoning, and code regulations as their adjacent neighbors. Please change the City of Boulder Ordinance 6136K to state that Boulder's prairie dog ordinances do not apply to city-owned land outside of Boulder corporate limits. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, ben? Hey there, Ben Valley, 740 32nd Street, Boulder. I grew up on a small farm, and I can tell you that we are up against Goliath. Oil and gas and industrial agriculture are already our Goliath, and here we are, David, trying to give you good food, healthy soil, land management, while Goliath tries to kill us and prairie dogs are like also having to deal with all of that and run around with 500 pound weights. It's crippling. As a member of the National Farmers Union, I can tell you that small farmers are an endangered species. I personally know hundreds of farmers who have given up their planet-saving regenerative farming because of Goliath. Without lethal control, you will drive farmers from Colorado, and from what I've heard, Boulder needs farmers to manage the land. You can't do it without us. We will leave without lethal control. On a different topic that seems weird, I was recently vegan for five years to protect animals. I love animals, and I can tell you with a heavy heart, it is our duty to act as responsible stewards of the land and act as the natural predators that prairie dogs used to have. We are even more humane than their natural predators. And I even wonder if you were to run the numbers when you look at what overpopulation does with these prairie dogs they all end up dying of disease instead of us being responsible and coming in as, 
So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Raymond Bridge, then April Story, Chris Brown, and then Paula Schuler. I'm Raymond Bridge, 435 South 38th Street in Boulder. Thanks to staff for a useful analysis and a good start. However, I would urge the board to look carefully at the analysis and to direct staff to follow a more realistic alternative. An emphasis on relocation won't work as a matter of simple arithmetic unless the plague happens to come in and save us. We need to seriously consider alternatives D and E. Continuing the current policies does not fulfill the charter purpose of preserving lo local agriculture, and it does not help the prairie dogs. Consigning them to starvation on land that cannot sustain them is not humane. Where lethal control is necessary, the county has found that using perk machines is the most humane and effective method. OSMP has the right policies and practices for managing prairie dogs on the grasslands we have successfully preserved. Those designated as prairie dog conservation areas, multiple objective areas, and grassland <coughs> preserves. Irrigated agricultural land is not compatible. Finally, I would urge you to communicate with City Council on the need to modify our ordinances to do two things. One, eliminate the prohibition on disturbing boroughs on agricultural properties, and two, allow the use of lethal control expeditiously on leased agricultural lands, not following 60,000 steps. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, April Story. Uh, Uh, hello, my name is April Story, and I live at 5387 Sunshine Canyon, Boulder, Colorado. And um, I have a wildflower farm there, so I'm surrounded by wilderness and since 1985. But I also have my feet on the ground in one of the projected areas here, Boulder Valley Ranch, every day for a couple hours. And I dare say that anyone that would come every day and put their feet and walk <coughs> through the prairie dog uh, uh, I wouldn't call it a town, it's more like Tokyo, um, would, it would be great information for your decision making. However, tonight I'm here as part of a group of people, um, and I would just like to say that we are here to ask you to change staff's proposed plan for removing prairie dogs from our precious irrigated agricultural lands. A warning, there will be math. Not folks' favorite subject, the many math errors in your packet suggests that staff doesn't like math much either. Last month, you directed staff to look at options C, D, and E, which would remove prairie dogs from 140 to 240 acres each year, and which would supposedly clear our irrigated lands in five to eight years. Staff has ignored your request for whatever reasons for options D and E, and instead has given you only option C. But there's a problem there. Instead of clearing 140 acres per year, as they claim, staff's option C only clears 85 to 100 acres a year and will supposedly take 10 years, not five to eight, to clear these irrigated lands. It's all on page 32 of your packet. Staff's cost figures confirm this. The only way to come in at the $2.1 million in three years using staff's own estimates is to only clear 85 acres, not even 100. This is not the option C that you asked for. This is option B in disguise. We call it option B2. Last month, you rejected option B. Please reject option B2 tonight. We ask this question, B2 or not B2? That is the question. We think it is nobler to suffer the slings and arrows of misfortune and to take up arms against the sea of trouble and by opposing end them. Please be noble. Reject staff's option B2 and come up with your own option E, the only option that will really protect our precious irrigated lands. Thank you. Thank you, April. Uh, Chris Brown, then Paula Schuler, then Elizabeth Black and Linda Parks. I'm Chris Brown, 4340 13th Street, Boulder. 
What I'm going to show you is based on your packet. <coughs> on page 22 of your packet, staff says OSMP's prairie dog acreage more than tripled in 10 years from 1,380 acres to 4,457 acres. This is in your packet. Using these numbers, we find that the prairie dog populations are growing by more than 12% per year. They actually grow much, much faster than 12% because we're not counting all the prairie dogs that migrate onto others' neighbors' lands. Our calculations are in the handout we have given you. Staff still says that prairie dog growth rates are only 3%. They are not. They are well over 12%. Why is this important? Because staff's option B2 won't even keep up with the uh, prairie dog population growth on irrigated, irrigated agricultural lands. And these pictures are showing you visual what is happening. With over 1,000 acres of infested irrigated OSMP land right now, you can expect more than 125 new prairie dog infested acres this year. More than 140 new infested acres next year. And so on this goes. Staff's option B2 only removes 85 to 100 acres per year. You will never make any progress with option B2. You will only lose ground with B2. You will not even keep up with population growth. We won't get ahead with options C or D either. You will just tread water, just keep killing for three quarters of a million dollars a year. There is absolutely no benefit. What you don't kill now will have to be killed or eliminated later on. In order to clear our agricultural lands, you must remove at least 250 acres of prairie dogs per year to get ahead of these growth rates. Only option E does that. It's simple math based on your own uh, information. Please do your math correctly, otherwise there will be no farmers left in Boulder County, and Boulder's open space will become a barren wasteland and take, that will take 100 years to restore. A farmer's allegiance is to the land and to the health of its soil, and not to politicians and public opinion. Boulder has professed its support of agriculture and farmers. Now it's time to bravely walk that talk more aggressively than is being done now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Chris. Paula? Good to go when my presentation comes up. That's okay. <laughs> and I'm pulling. Did you know that? Oh, that's like the third or fourth slide. Oh, I can't. Okay. Okay. There we go. Hi. Paula Schuler, Boulder County. During the last public engagement window, OSBT received over 50 emails from neighbors of city irrigated ag parcels. Another 15 neighbors came to the February OSBT meeting and spoke to you in person. You know that prairie dogs from open space are emigrating all year long and causing damage to neighboring private properties. What you might not realize is how many prairie dogs the neighbors are actually killing each year. This chart shows annual mitigation numbers from 10 neighbors of open space irrigated ag properties. The neighbors are killing over 10,000 prairie dogs per year. 10 neighbors are killing over 10,000 prairie dogs per year. There are hundreds of private property owners that border, border, border city ag open space, and that means tens and tens of thousands of open space prairie dogs are being killed by neighbors each year. No one in Boulder County wants prairie dogs on their private property. No one likes to kill prairie dogs. It's not something that anyone wants to do, but is a, it is a necessity because we are neighbors of open space. These numbers need to be taken into account when calculating growth rates and recommending any realistic management plan. 100 or 140 acres a year is not close to realistic. For any of these options to be effective, open space must keep well ahead of the true growth rate and also make progress on decreasing the existing prairie dog populations. 
This is um, my attempt at putting together a chart to see what is really going on in the project area, parcel by parcel. It is challenging to put these numbers together when you do not have all the information. But the point of this is, to me, um, I'd like OSMP to please request an itemized list of all properties which open space will address both inside and outside of the project area, including prairie dog occupation maps and percentages for every parcel. A detailed inventory of individual ag properties um, and their <coughs> occupation levels throughout open space is necessary to accurately assess the extent of damage to your land. Staff's, staff's mapping of irrigated versus managed and staff's ever-changing acreage totals in their preferred management plan makes it very unclear which properties they will address. Um, this is, I want to talk about growth rates again, Boulder Valley Ranch. It's hard to see the image, but these are the same places. And that um, one on the right is 2019 where a brown swath runs through there with a lot of prairie dogs. In 2017, this pasture had 50 acres of prairie dogs. In 2019, it had 112 acres of prairie dogs. Um, I'm not a mathematician, but to me, in two years, that's over 100% growth. So um, that's alarming to me. This is what the southern part of the project area looks like. The yellow is prairie dog <laughs> occupation. This is, again, individual parcels. I believe Belgrove and Mackenzie North need to be included in this because they are right there and they're at 81% and 74% occupied. It's only logical that they are included in the plan. Is that three minutes? Oh boy, okay. Ditzel had 60% growth, so I'm just gonna run through these and show you. Oasis has huge neighbor problems because it's so overpopulated. Bennett was a $3.5 million purchase. That was your soil experiment that was shut down because of prairie dog occupation. That's your whole area right there. So, thank you. Thanks, Paula. Elizabeth? Then Linda Parks, Cody Oreck, and Eric Skoken. Hi, Elizabeth Black, 4340 North 13th Street. Open space has budget woes, we get that. So let's play some budget games. I sent you my handy dandy cost control spreadsheet so you and staff can play along too. For those in the audience, just watch the yellow and green squares for running totals. We'll start with my best staff stab at recreating staff's budget for option B2, which starts with 3.6 full-time staff to super the project. Then add 1,200 prairie dogs relocated. I had to limit live trapping and perk to only 45 acres instead of the advertised 100 acres to come in at budget. I added the cheapest land restoration, 5,000 feet of temporary barrier and 500 feet of wire barrier, and the $1,000 per acre mitigation fee for lethal control. Et voila, $2.1 million for three years, 255 acres cleared at $8,200 per acre. Let's see what happens if we make some different choices and shoot for option E. I'll still use private contractors and pay for 3.6 full-time staff to supervise them. But I'll only relocate 300 prairie dogs, the same as last year. I want to clear 250 acres with perk, but will limit live trapping to 20 acres. I'll give my tenants and, cart and neighbors gas cartridges so they can deal with small incursions right away. I'll install 1,000 feet of temporary barrier and 5,000 feet of wire barrier. I'll restore all 260 acres using the most expensive restoration methods. I won't pay any mitigation, and presto bingo, I come in $342,000 under budget, clear over 780 acres for $2,250 an acre. That's still too expensive, and our packet shows you how you can save even more money by bringing work in-house and following Boulder County's model. The county spends around $830 per acre. Your scarce funds must be allocated wisely and strategically. 
Staff's budget for option B2 ignores easy savings and pushes the priciest methods, yielding excessive costs and absolutely no progress clearing land. Please choose to be nobler and by opposing a sea of troubles like all of us here in the audience, end them. Please support option E. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, Linda? Linda Parks, 2207 Mapleton Avenue. I first begin by questioning the election of the Prairie Dog Working Group, the people that were elected, how they were elected, how they were chosen, and why there weren't more agricultural people on them, and any results they have come up with thrown out. Why are we really thinking about relocating and spending money on relocating uh, 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 on prairie dogs? We have plenty of rodents to support raptors, coyotes, and other species that are lucky enough to catch one. They have no trouble breeding, and their insatiable appetite for our grasslands is destroying it. What will Boulder residents really think when they learn the truth about relocation and its cost? The inborrow dusting with the pesticide Delta dust. This pesticide changes our environment, affects bees, insects, frogs, and fish. Placed in the burrows on both removal and receiving sites, advocates say, don't worry, it's in the burrow. Prairie dogs dig and displace soils. This leads to the good chance of it blowing across our lands and into my lungs and your kids. Backhoes are required to excavate hundreds of nesting boxes on pristine open space. Huge amounts of plastic tubing is placed into the grasslands. When, when is that removed? How much does that cost? Invasive weeds proliferate at nesting sites. All for what? A survival rate for re relocated prairie dogs less than 50%? Relocation is a waste of time and valuable resources that can go to perk and restoration efforts. Allocate the monies to clear, restore, and protect OSMP irrigated aglands. Boulder County states that relocation is not an appropriate strategy for relocating uh, for clearing lands of prairie dogs. It should only be used to repopulate areas where more prairie dogs are needed. We can get these, if needed, from other urban sites. What will residents really think when they, will really think when they learn the cost? I believe support for relocation will plummet. Before another season of prairie dog growth, let's get started restoring our ag lands, protecting our neighbors, and giving other ground nesting birds, rabbits, and species a place to breed. Allow perk to begin tomorrow, allow burrow destruction, and let's clear our ag lands of this species to bring balance to the ecosystem. Thank you, Linda. Cody, then Eric Skoken, Robert O'Donnell, and Brian Copham. Cody Oreck, 203 Morningside Park Road. We are a community whose foundation, our soil, is suffering. We are suffering because we failed to stick to our principles. We developed a city charter, open space master plan, agricultural management plan, climate action plan, and any number of soil health programs, all through due process, and then we abandoned those principles and plans to allow one species to proliferate to the harm of the very lands we committed to managing. We must stop prairie dogs making deserts of our irrigated ag lands. As we now wrestle with the costs and the consequences of abandoning our principles, and we struggle to find a way to restore these historic farmlands, because please make no mistake, the ag lands in contention we bought as farmlands to remain farmlands. We are asked, being asked in option B2 to pay $1,000 per acre to the Grassland Conservation Fund for prairie dogs primarily. OSMP and taxpayers should not be penalized for protecting agricultural lands purchased by us to remain agricultural. As prairie dogs have overrun these farms, the city manager and the city council have been negligent in not modifying the code so that OSMP could adequately protect our ag lands from colonization. We have some 80,000 acres of pristine open space grasslands where we can nurture healthy prairie dog culture in appropriate habitat. But soil health and the millions of diverse organisms required for growing food and sequestering carbon must be the primary goal on the irrigable ag 
ag lands. It is useless to even dream of restoring these soils while they are crowded with prairie dogs. The restoration process of seeding sequential cover crops designed to rebuild the missing topsoil, flail mowing, livestock rotation, and the intensive management required is a far more important cost than 1,000 per acre to prairie dogs. Only option E will allow us to adhere to the management principles we created as a responsible community. Thank you, Cody. Eric? Uh, hi there, uh, Eric Skokan, I'm an open uh, space uh, tenant. Um, I agree with uh, staff that uh, some changes need to be made to the ordinance. Uh, in, uh, when it all comes down to it, it's the ordinance that has gotten us all here and killed massive amounts of time. Uh, and it's a fundamentally flawed, um, it's a fundamentally flawed uh, ordinance. It doesn't work. It is essentially a zip tie. Uh, it only goes in one direction. Right, and uh, all policy needs to balance uh, all needs. We we all understand that, and this is a policy, this ordinance that does that does not do that. Uh, on a humorous level, it reminds me of the Kurt Vonnegut book, um, uh, Cat's Cradle. Like we have created in the Prairie Dog Ordinance, Ice Nine. Uh, we we are living through Ice Nine right now, and it's 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 baffling. And I think we need to we we need to move away. Uh, away from it uh, very, very quickly. Um, here are a couple changes that I would love uh, for all of you to consider. Number one is that the borough destruction ordinance is crushing. Uh, it is it is so hard uh, and it is uh, so uh, completely devastating for farming operations. When a new prairie dog uh, burrow comes in into a field, we back up, right? And it's just continual and it's continual. Um, uh, n number two is um, uh, it would be, I think, very, very simple to, to make the ordinance apply to only properties that uh, are in the city and not those that are in the county. I think it's brilliant, and it's literally in the document, I think it's like 14 words or maybe it's 16 words that we have to strike. It's a super simple uh, change uh, which could be uh, powerful and quick in an ad administrative sense. Um, I normally don't believe that a stroke of a pen changes lives, but this is one of those examples where that, where that actually could happen. Um, I think the ordinance needs to be changed to allow uh, tenants to participate uh, in this. Uh, partici uh, tenants feel uh, depressed and uh, unable to cope uh, because all of this is out of our hands. Um, when you're, you bring us in as uh, operators, as partners, uh, in a real sense, um, then uh, great things can happen. And farmers are frugal. It can happen uh, very, very uh, inexpensively. Um, the easiest solution, obviously, is just to scrap the ordinance entirely. Um, that, that's a really challenging thing, uh, but certainly it would be the quickest uh, of all of the options. Regardless of the, the, the plan and the proposals, I think the important thing and one of the lessons that we're learning right now is that uh, we didn't have a backup plan. Uh, when the ordinance was written, we didn't have a backup plan. When you choose option whatever, make sure that you have a contingency plan that follows behind that. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Robert, then Brian Copham, Jeremy Gregory, and Maria Wasson. Good evening, I'm Robert O'Donnell, 7634 North 41st Street. Um, you've seen my face before, and um, I'm back again. And uh, what I talk about, what I've talked about before is the collateral damage, the collateral damage that I'm, I'm dealing with day in and day out. I'm, I'm asking the staff and uh, the people that sit behind me, the pros and cons, to come out, get away from your desk, get out of your chairs, and see the true damage that's happening. Uh, Paula Schuler showed you the costs. Mine's one of the smaller properties. Since February 12th, another month has gone by. Unfortunately, in this next month, the pups will be born. And I'm, I, I, guys and gals, I'm fighting this day in and day out, and it's a losing battle. I have a three acre property, and I'm out there every day. I broke my hip, my wife's out there every day. And when you all come, I'd love for you to come, bring a shovel, and we might be able to fill in some of the prairie dogs in my front yard. We will not. I'm surrounded by 
the Stratton and Brubaker open space, it continues to grow. It continues to grow with prairie dogs, and my property continues to suffer. And I just, I'm asking for some accountability. You all purchased the open space to maintain the open space. When I'm out on open space, there's rules and regs that I have to follow. When my dog's out there, he has to be within whistle range, he has to wear a green tag, I can't ride a mountain bike when the, when the uh, trails are dirty or muddy. But I would say your prairie dogs are on my property and I'm having to pay for that. I would get a ticket. If you guys look at on, uh, in the, um, on the website, up to $300 fine for things that you do on open space. I'm spending a lot more than that a month trying and I'm asking for help. So please listen to the folks behind us and please help us out. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Brian? Hello, Brian Copham with Boulder County Farmers Markets, 5445 Conestoga Court in Boulder. Uh, so I really don't want to be here tonight. I'm sure you don't either, but um, <laughs> I, I'm here because I read comments related to this balance. Things are out of balance. This is a question of balance. And we're being asked to figure out how to create things, put them back into balance, which is the staff's charge. Uh, but it's also about responsibility. And I had read comments of individuals saying, you know, let's just get rid of the agricultural land. What, what do we need farms here for anyway? I want to remind everybody that this isn't about necessarily just individual farmers. Those people are critically important, but this is also about a food system. And I think of Boulder, after living here for 44 years, as a place of responsibility. We need to take responsibility for the food we eat. And saying that let's just get rid of agricultural lands is the same as saying let somebody else deal with the problems of what I eat. I don't want to deal with it. And that is not a tenable position for this community. Nobody that I know thinks lightly of killing prairie dogs or killing anything for that matter. Uh, but these are hard choices, and a food system, not having a food system, is not a choice that we want to choose. It's not a choice we want to make. Also, the farmers are stewards of the land. They are one of our best opportunities to have healthy ecosystems, to have balanced lands. The pollinator habitat that they're creating, the ecological systems, the clean water, the healthy soil, these are things we desperately need, and the farmers are the ones who are able to create this, and I really advocate that we continue to put the farmers forward in solving this very difficult problem. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Jeremy, uh, then Maria Wasson, Lindsay Sterling Crank, and Taylor Jones. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Jeremy Gregory, and I'm here to put on your radar a solution to, among other things, the keystone species dilemma that is being discussed. Before I touch on this uh, concept briefly, let me preface a little bit on who I am. I'm a third generation Colorado native who comes from a long line of eco-conscious farmers, educators, altruists, and philanthropists. I grew up on a farm here in Boulder County where my family cultivated over a thousand acres of a variety of crops. We were one of the first in the region to use ladybugs as a natural pesticide rather than a destructive DDT that was predominantly used. And where able, we incorporated regenerative and biodynamic low-till practices. I served in Peace Corps Malawi teaching conservation, sustainability, community-based natural resource management, and innovative agriculture. I've spent the last 20 years in nonprofit and social entrepreneurial development, having created and co-created a number of uh, nonprofit organizations, projects, and programs. And I'm currently the director for a nonprofit that supports, in many different ways, solutions-based organizations in a diverse advocating for eco-social causes. I'm also the co-CEO for Sustainable Agriculture Public Benefit Corporation that cultivates and produces hemp-derived products for people and planet. This past year, we successfully cultivated on two sites here in Boulder County, around 20 acres and about 15 acres in South Carolina. With our colleagues in Malawi, Africa, we helped draft with the government the county's version of the Farm Bill where it passed just a few weeks ago, opening the door for hemp cultivation in the country. 
there we will be growing about 150 acres and then exponentially expanding into subsequent years. So what does this have to do with prairie dogs, you're probably asking? Well, we don't grow just to grow. Within the fabric and model of our company, we cultivate and produce to achieve the triple bottom line. The TBL is a framework of theory that directs companies to commit to and focus on social environmental concerns just as much as profits. The TBL posits that instead of one bottom line, there should be three, profit, people, and planet. So we're doing this on our sites currently, and we have found ways to coexist with prairie dogs while ensuring an, optimi uh, an optimization of profits. On one of our sites, we are growing about 15 acres, and we have about 100 prairie dogs, and we're able to do this successfully because of our model. I would like to share this with you guys at some point. We're working with world-renowned ecologists and biologists such as Sean Wilmore of the Thin Green Line Foundation, Trent Bunderson, all the way up to Jane Goodall. I think she'd be appalled here to hear some of the comments made tonight because we can definitely coexist with nature and truly have sustainable agriculture. We have moved past this theory and into proof of concepts, and I'm here to implore you to find time to allow me to share more in detail what we would like to propose. I hope you will meet with me and see how together we can successfully handle this issue in a way that achieves a triple bottom line where everyone benefits in many ways, including our wildlife. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Jeremy. Oh, Jeremy. Yep. Can you just repeat, you have 100 prairie dogs on how many acres? We have about, well, we're cultivating on 15 acres right now, so. 15 acres with 100 prairie dogs. With about 100 acres, yeah, with, with about 100 prairie dogs, correct. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Maria? Hello, I'm Maria Wasson, 10594 North 65th Street in Longmont. And I have been your neighbor for, I think you've owned the Oasis property for about 17 years. And um, I just want to say, you will never make everyone happy. <laughs> so you need to figure out what you can do realistically with this resources that you have and with the lands that you have. I think it's pretty been pretty clear. I'm interested in this last guy's presentation of how to grow on on uh, land that is shared by prairie dogs because I certainly haven't figured it out. Um, I think it's a waste of money to trap and relocate. I think lethal mitigation, your option E, is your best, most uh, viable alternative at this point. I guess I'm just wondering, are you wanting to set up for success? with your lands or not. And if you're not, sell them. Because being your neighbor is very expensive and is definitely putting a damper on my farming capabilities. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Uh, Lindsay Sterling Crank, then Taylor Jones, Kars Pussmuller, and Lynn Siegel. <coughs> We're pulling all of our time. So I'll get started. Um, my name is Kars Pessmuller, 383 Jasper Drive, Lyons, 80540. And uh, we're speaking for, uh, we're actually going to read the comments that uh, Keep Boulder Wild submitted. And uh, we have the full support of the uh, uh, Sierra Club Indian Peaks Group, the Prairie Dog Coalition. The Humane Society of the United States, the Prairie Dog Action Group, uh, Save Colorado's Prairie Dogs, and uh, the Wild Earth Guardians. 
We support staff's attention to consider all sides of this complex issue. We have focused our attention on the preferred alternative and have some suggestions, modifications that we think would more effectively decrease conflicts while also maximizing non-lethal solutions and methods. Number one, focus on areas of greatest conflict throughout the three-year plan in order to reduce both conflicts and pr public pressure. These areas include the acreages on the two lease areas that are 55 and 58 percent occupied. It also includes neighboring properties where conflict is severe and fencing would be effective. Number two, make the number of acres of prairie dogs removed lethally and non-lethally equal. In other words, increase the 40 acres you're projecting for relocations to 70 acres annually and decrease the 100 acres for lethal down to 70. So you'd still get 140 acres. Um, it, it would increase the prairie dog populations in the southern grasslands where are currently only 3% occupancy. There is habitat available down there to build up to OSMP's target uh, occupancy of 10 to 26%, so let's do that. We need more prairie dogs uh, relocated to the southern grasslands. The higher relocation target could be financially feasible if you used smaller, less expensive relocators who could be under contract with OSMP early in the season uh, to make sure that they could be available. And also the Prairie Dog Coalition, Coalition has offered a relocation for 10 acres. Um, number three, expand the trapping window from one week to 10 to 14 days and allow flushing. Five days of actual prairie dog trapping is unrealistic. Trapping includes state required plague management, which is about a week. Also, we request a minimum prebate period of three days. Um, so together that would be 21 days of trapping before you did lethal, and that's a realistic number. Number four, pilot one to two innovative alternative leases on irrigated egg lands. Uh, this issue we continue to bring up, but it continues to be dismissed, and we are here to stress its importance in contributing to the solutions because it has been very successful in other locations. We have land trusts who are willing to work with the city on this issue. Examples could be co-leases between ranchers and conservation organizations. Um, also, um, conservation organizations are willing to lease land for wildlife purposes and also to study soil and sequestration. And also to have leases uh, where the leasees would explore different lucrative agricultural crops or methodologies. And on the co-leases, if you had a conservation group and a rancher farmer both on the same lease, they would pay, each entity would pay determined by the prairie dog occupancy. So in years when the prairie dog occupancy was really high, that payments would be made by the conservation organization and, you know, vice versa, if the prairie dog populations were low, then the rancher leasing would pay most of it. And so um, that would be the kind of leases that have been worked successfully otherwise, and then the city gets their income from that lease. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Cars. And before, no, no, since you're all standing there, uh, could you introduce yourselves to us? Okay. I don't mean to like speeches, because I know you're about to speak next, but just, just to let us know your name. Stop the time, because she's, we figured it sure. out. Sure. We had nine minutes. And so now it says I have 140. No, you'll, we'll give you three minutes, because okay. I just wanted, uh, just as a matter of politeness, just Lindsay tell us the Sterling, name. Yeah. Lindsay Sterling Crank, 210 Brook Road. Taylor Jones, 1450 Albion Street. Anna Lynn Vanden Houghton, 1018 South Moline Street. Nicole Hugo, 1770 in Folsom. Right. Susan Summers, 4636 55th Street. Maureen Laurie, 2385 Vassar. Okay, thanks for introducing yourselves. Uh, Lindsay, and then you get three minutes. Okay. Or whichever order you want, I don't, I'm indifferent. We should have four minutes left. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. We should have had three minutes each because we have three speakers. That's nine, I don't know, whatever. Okay. We tried hard. Okay. So I'll continue the comments. Um, number five, create a three-year time-limited exemptions to existing rules, permits, and ordinances to implement the expedited plan if necessary. Instead of changing rules, developing special permits, and proposing new ordinances. The expedited plan is created for a specific problem on prairie dog occupied irrigated agricultural lands. It should be used for that purpose only and not extended in time or geographical range. Number six, identify the conditions granted to the city manager that could cease implementation of the expedited plan. 
Conditions include but are not limited to the overall health of the northern and southern grasslands prairie dog metapopulations and whether they are experiencing plague epizootics. Grassland occupancy is too low to sufficiently sustain prairie dogs and if conflicts are reduced on leased properties. Number seven, reduce relocation costs by hiring smaller local relocators. An example, the Humane Society of the United States invoiced the city of Boulder approximately $1,500 per acre to complete the Wanaka Foothills Community Park relocation in 2013 and 2014. That included in-kind donations. And our current 2020 relocations typically cost about $2,500 per acre, and nearly half the 4,500 the 4, acres cited in the staff's March 10th, 2020 memo. Prey dog actions relocations over the past two years averaged $865 per acre. Thank you. Thanks, Taylor. Okay. So many of us were on the Prairie Dog Working Group, well, three of us, and our, I wanted to stress that the Prairie Dog Working Group wasn't about growing prairie dogs. The Prairie Dog Working Group was about decreasing conflicts using the most non-lethal management possible. So to that end, that's why we keep stressing to do the Prairie Dog Working Group recommendations, because we haven't had a chance for them to be implemented, for the conflicts to be reduced, and then we have the lethal and non-lethal discussion. In that, since so it's been three years now, we've supported the borough ordinance to have changes so that we could get rid of boroughs in areas where we can have more agriculture and increase tolerance and coexistence. I think the fact that we haven't done that for the last three years and we've been talking about it has created more conflict and we are in support of that being changed and we'd like to be a part of that process. Um, we also, also think that the soils and sequestration goals are awesome and they shouldn't be a part of an expedited conversation. It's too complex, it's too long term and removing prairie dogs is gonna marginally increase our sequestration goals. We don't even know that. Um, I do want th think that we need to be doing plague management. If we are going to be getting rid of a bunch of prairie dogs, then we need to be protecting the prairie dogs that you guys are all saying are protected. They're not protected. They're all vulnerable to plague, and they are all gonna die from plague at a certain point of time. So to increase this stasis that we're all looking for, no matter what's coming to us, that is something we're all looking for, and plague management tools help us get there, and I think it's our responsibility to create that for everybody. The Grassland Conservation Fund, yes, we support that. We think it helps create balance, and it's also not just for prairie dog conservation. It's, again, something that's to reduce conflict. So is it for restoration? Is it for barriers? Is it for proactive, non-lethal management opportunities that we could do that prevent these conflicts from getting worse in the long run and creating more unhealthy neighbor issues. I will admit that open space didn't do a lot of proactive prairie dog management over the, over the last 10 years because with the neighbor issues, and that is something that was important to the prairie dog working group to take on, is how can we help the neighbors? We like people too. Okay, there you go. Okay, thank you, Lindsay, and thanks to all of you. Uh, then next is Lynn Siegel, followed by Marcus McCauley, John Brown, and then Jenny Bryant. Lynn? I don't agree with anyone so far. First, we need to reduce our food waste in Boulder. Um, we need to stop cattle production. I um, eat muscle myself, non-human muscle. I'm not glad about that. I eat very minimal, but I don't need to. Nobody needs to. And that's a lot of the problem. Um, overpopulation, I haven't heard any discussion of that. Um, our conflict with natural wildlife, I haven't really heard about that, especially in view of the coronavirus, which has a lot to do with human and wildlife interaction. And species development within a contained space and with climate change and overpopulation, we are displacing populations of animals more and more that have developed immune responses in their indigenous environments and we're gonna have a whole lot more of this to come. It's part of climate change. It's called coronavirus. Um, I'd like to hear you stop saying lethal control. Just say kill. What's wrong with kill? Because that's what it is. Um, I like what Jeremy said, the triple bottom line. 
He's right on. I liked what Lindsay said. You know, you're turning people against each other. This is a dysfunctional community, Boulder is. We aren't watching our food waste, and yet we're dealing with these kind of issues of killing these little animals. Um, I think people don't even need that much food, and with the food waste that we have in this community, we have no business thinking of even killing one prairie dog. Thank you, Lynn. Marcus? Ms. Marcus? Oh, okay. All right, when he, let's go to John Brown if Marcus comes back. Thank you so much. Um, John Brown, Brown's Farm. We raise vegetables, sell them at the Longmont Farmer's Market. I run a string of cows. The first thing I'd like to say is I've seen some really good sign of staff's work this spring. Um, I saw wildland fire out today, burning all the ditches at IBM. It's, uh, it's outstanding, some of the work I've seen done. My cows are run at David Hyman's property, which abuts the properties to the north of Monarch Road. Those fields have been removed of prairie dogs. They will not stay in that state because of the feeding stocks that can come in from the west. Um, I want to speak passionately about the land. I want to speak about the soil, and I want to speak about grass. Uh, my advocation is restoration agriculture, soil testing, soil amendments, and how can we get the best return. Uh, I can see a kestrel and know that the land that that bird flies over is healthy and is working. Just because a bird of prey is small doesn't mean that it, that, uh, it isn't valuable. And if we can have abundant seed stocks, we can keep small bird populations, we'll have merlins. So it's just not one species or one, one issue. Unfortunately, I view the prairie dog as a plague. I view it as a cancer. In just the same way, we wouldn't poke around with a disease or cancer on our skin. We would exercise it and remove it as quickly and as immediately as we could. We wouldn't wait a year and come back and work on it some more. So I'm an advocate for E, that we need to work swiftly, intently, with will, as a community, to restore these irrigated lands. Thank you, John. Marcus? <clears throat> Hello, Marcus McCauley. I live at 9421 North 63rd Street in Longmont. <clears throat> I, uh, it was hard for me to come here today because I wanted to be out seeding. And it's the last little bit of daylight before the weather comes in. You know, and I know a lot of other farmers wanted to be here, but they're out doing that too. Um, I think, I think we all share a lot of values. I think on many issues, probably most issues, we'd be on the same side. I think we all love the land. And we're talking about agricultural land here. And is there a food farmer here who is against lethal control? Is that because we are evil farmers? Or is it because we know what it's like to have our life's work, our year's work disappear before our eyes, and we know the reality on the ground? I'm sure we've all enjoyed a meal today. Everybody here has probably got some food in their bellies. How many of us truly know how many animals died to make that meal? How many rodents and worms and insects and ruminants and birds died so that we can live? I have a study here for you that estimates between six to 50 rodents per acre per year to grow food. And that's not counting birds and other animals. That's your lunch that's in your belly right now, and I don't care who you are or what your diet is. It's easy to forget that when you get your food from packages at Whole Foods. I know I'm biased, but I think that we have some of the best farmers that you could ask for here in Boulder County, farmers that communities across, across this country would love to have efforting to feed them. 
You have a good amount of them in this room asking for your help. It's time to empower them to manage these lands, to feed our community. We need to be allowed to disturb boroughs, and we need to act quickly with lethal control. Uh, Marcus, quick question. Um, I noticed your hat. I was surprised that we didn't get any emails from Mad Ag. Um, do you, are you affiliated with them? I work closely with them actually on some open space land. Can, can you encourage them to send the trustees some information regarding some of their thoughts on this? I was just surprised not to see that. Certainly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, Jenny Bryant. Hello, Jenny Bryant, resident of Boulder County, but I am actually here tonight to speak on behalf of Deb Jones, who could not be here. She is the president of Prairie Dog Action. As someone who has dedicated 25 years to working in conservation of our prairie ecosystem and appreciates the role prairie dogs play in this ecosystem, I am concerned at the continuing eagerness to rush to judgment that the prairie dog is always the guilty party. While these local lands have been dedicated to our local agricultural heritage of approximately 150 years, the prairie dog and their ecosystem is our natural heritage that far outdates the local agricultural community and is just as valuable and deserves our protection also. Because of this, I volunteered my time with the prairie dog working group and spent two years in group meetings, subcommittee meetings, and doing homework for these meetings. Many hours were dedicated to researching local conflicts and finding resolutions that match the values of bolder citizens. I feel we offered recommendations that met the needs of the whole community and not just a select few. We all agreed that prairie dogs and irrigated agricultural fields are not a good match and a main focus of our recommendations dealt with resolving this conflict. As with most things in life, anything worth doing takes time and this is no different. Recently, while researching erosion papers, it came to my attention about levels of erosion in the North Boulder area during the 2013 flood. They measured 1,000 years of erosion in the upper left-hand canyon and 100 years in the lower left-hand water district. Flood waters were actually changed channeled into the agricultural fields by the irrigation channels. In all of our recent discussions, this cause of massive erosion in these conflict areas has never been discussed as a possible cause of the conditions of these fields. This needs to be explored more, more fully. Another topic that does not seem to have been mentioned in any of the information on prairie dogs and their impacts on these fields has to do with the study of mound soils on prairie dog colonies. I have found two studies on this topic. Mound soils are higher in nutrients than soils on the rest of the colony due to the constant mineral deposits from below ground that are added to our organic matter at the surface where the soils are churned and topped with urine fecal matter from prairie dogs and other animals. With so many questions and unexplored issues, I ask that you do not rush to judgment or move forward with changing policy and go straight to killing our native species that play such a vital role in our prairies and its other inhabitants. I am happy to supply the links for these studies. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And just be aware, you've been grabbing the microphone that a ton of people have been speaking into, so if you want to use the hands, just, I didn't know if you were conscious of the fact that you were doing that. Okay, sure. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, Erica, has anyone else signed up to speak? Okay. Um, so before I close, L, come on. I didn't know we were already here. Come on, L or Leslie, just come on down. Come on down. The price is right. <laughs> and then John Alice will be after you. I to wear our artist brayer or hat. So, um, Al <clears throat> Cushman and I live in hygiene. So I didn't really go through all the E's and A's and B's of it because I don't even think the best option is going to work. We're doing that test field. I was on the prairie dog working group, by the way, and I also do not think the prairie dogs are the bad guys in this. I'm going to touch this. Sorry. Um, they're not. They're victims in this right along with a lot of other victims. They didn't make the world, and I feel bad for them. Um, they, I, during those prairie dog talks, one of the prairie dog people said, I don't think they should be on irrigated fields. I didn't even think they were. They got where they weren't even supposed to be, a lot of them. In that project area, I bet there's 250,000 prairie dogs, easy. And they're replicating right now at 150% till June. Um, that test plot on Monarch, it's gonna take, first of all, you have to have the acreage to relocate them to. They're relocating them to Babe and Leo's grazing land. Those are agricultural leases too. What is that solving? And they're fragile 
dry land prairies that can't take it, they don't meet the criteria for relocation. And it's because of their slope and their rocky soil. They're not gonna make it. We have a hill at the Cushman Place that we're probably gonna lose this year to erosion when the rain comes. Hundreds of thousands of years, that damn hill has been there. Six, four years of prairie dog occupation. We're gonna lose it, the topography of our county. That's serious stuff. But on the mitigation study on Monarch, they say we have to leave 60 feet of fringe around a 40-acre field. That takes three-fourths of that field out of agricultural production. What did that fix? At the county yesterday, we went to their prairie dog. Um, I'm pooling with John Ellis um, to their update. And they're letting us do um, cartridges now on fields that have been cleared. And they, a four to six foot fringe meets the prairie dog people's criteria. It doesn't have to be 60. Um, these families have poured their hearts and souls into these lands. They were conserved long before these agreements took place. They never felt like the land was theirs. It always belongs to the next generation with these families. That's how they roll. This is gutting them along with this land. We've got to figure this out. And I think when I remember hearing about the administrative rule where there is an emergency stop gap, and I think it's time we hit that red button. And I also, my sister was gonna come with me tonight, but she was sick, but she thought that we needed to make up a new s slogan for Boulder, that headline in the New York Times that year, Boulder, 25 square miles surrounded by reality. Change it to 20, Boulder, 25 square miles surrounded by prairie dogs. Thank you. Thank <laughs> All right, thanks, Al. So with that, um, I think that's the end of comment from people who are physically present. We did, uh, in light of the unusual circumstances in which we find ourselves, make an offer to people who, are, who felt unable to attend for health reasons to email us their comments. Um, and we received three that, we, uh, that I will read. They're all very short. The fourth uh, was Deb Jones, and I think Jenny Bryan already spoke on Deb's behalf, so I won't separately read uh, both um, her email and the oral comments that were delivered. But I also want to just assure everyone that as always, um, any email comments that we received, you know, we, we do our very best to read them. Kurt is nodding that he has done so. I know I have uh, right up until I hopped in my car to drive here. So we have three sets of comments from, uh, that sort of meet, meet the description of what I gave before. The first is from Christopher Boardman to the Open Space Board of Trustees. This is in regard to the City of Boulder's proposed removal of prairie dogs from irrigated open space properties. I question the wisdom of removing a potentially very large number of prairie dogs from open space, both from the standpoint of impact on this keystone species and the adverse effects on associated wildlife, such as nesting bald eagles and other raptors. Please ensure that you know what you are doing and the consequences for prairie dogs and species that utilize prairie dogs as a prey base. This could be an ecological catastrophe. Sincerely, Chris Boardman. Uh, the second is from Tessa Hale at 3490 16th Circle in Boulder. Uh, to Open Space Board of Trustees, in the last two generations, we have lost over 60% of wildlife on the planet as their habitats have been replaced by humans, their infrastructure, and domestic livestock. Let's not let that happen here. Prairie dogs are a native keystone species. They are an ecosystem regulator, providing countless ecosystem services, such as churning the soil, increasing plant diversity, and helping recharge groundwater. Prairie dogs enhance the habitat for over 150 other wildlife species. I support the following strategies to address the concerns for farmers and those supporting a native keystone species. Increase the number of acres relocated to 70 acres annually and decrease the number of prairie dogs otherwise removed, paren trap, euthanized for ferret food, or relocate if possible to 70 acres annually. 
Expand the trapping window from one week to 10 to 14 days as five days is unrealistic and allow flushing for removal acres not being relocated by the city. Please pilot one to two innovative alternative leases such as leasing prairie dog occupied properties to conservation organizations that manage and protect the land for wildlife habitat or working with lessees to explore different agricultural crops or methodologies. Prairie dogs are an essential part of our ecosystem and we need to ensure we don't alter our natural world to the point of lost flora and fauna. Sincerely, Tessa Hale. <clears throat> uh, the uh, last um, it says is from Liv and Maev Hurahan, uh, 3490-16th Circle in Boulder, Charlie and Leo Rosenthal, 8560 Flagstaff in Boulder, Lily Lisbon, 1350 Grape Avenue, Boulder, Emma, Della, and Celia Baumgartner, uh, 1119 Portland in Boulder, and Lucy and Savannah Crank, 2010 Brook Road in Boulder, and these individuals are all aged between 6 and 13 years old. We, the undersigned, ask the Open Space Board of Trustees to maximize non-lethal prairie dog management in your decision tonight. We would also like to volunteer with the relocation efforts, period. So um, with that, uh, unless Erica or Megan tell me there's something that I've missed. Nope. All right, then. So we will close public comment uh, <clears throat> and come back to the board. So. I'd like to make a suggestion, because this is uh, to bring some structure uh, to this. And so my first suggestion is that we ident identify any changes that any of us would like to make or propose making to the preferred alternative from staff to kind of run through those, not to do five minutes of advocacy of why you want that, but just to see what they are. Um, I think then we can sort of group them together and provide some structure around this. It may also serve as kind of initial sense of sort of where the board is. Um, <clears throat> and I think once we identify what changes at least an individual wants to propose, we'll then, you know, construct your motions and see, you know, whether the majority or agrees or disagrees with any specific proposed change. And then I propose, after we do that and vote on those uh, specific changes, we can then discuss other, other broader statements, whether to council or staff or things that we'd like to propose that sort of aren't in the nature of a very specific change, like, you know, more of this and less of that, um, those kinds of changes. So <clears throat> with your indulgence, um, I'd like to, you know, as I say, start by just having anyone who wishes to go first identify you know, some specific changes they would propose and then uh, we'll see where we are on that and can start structuring some motions and discussions around those changes. Kurt, I know, are you? Uh, uh, I will start. Thank you. Uh, I think my overarching concern is scale. Um, I, I tried to replicate a staff's spreadsheet uh, and I think it matches up pretty well, but it just reinforces how critically dependent achieving our goals uh, is on the rates of population growth. For example, package C, we're saying nine years at 3%, but if it's 12%, it's 20 years. And so I, I want to find a way to avoid misleading counsel uh, that we may have a smaller problem than we really do. And so I'm concerned about the scope and scale of what we're proposing. Uh, I will say otherwise I find the staff's work and all of their findings and general approaches and policies to be uh, really good. I'm just concerned about whether this problem is just going to continue to outgrow our efforts. Um, so I think we could convey, if it's the will of the board to counsel, sort of part of what you're saying is a more general concern to got manage expectations, for lack of a better phrase. But within scale, is there a particular either scaling up that you're proposing, a shift in the mix, or just, uh, you know, kind of a reality check that we be... Uh, as I say, manage expectations? Well, I think it suggests that we should throw everything at this that we can find. And 
I believe there's an important reason to do relocations where they support prairie dog conservation and where those relocations can be uh, received on in an ecologically way, sound way on our receiving land. Uh, but otherwise, I think we have to put all of our resources that we can into getting ahead of the population growth rates. And so that means being absolutely as efficient as we can be, because otherwise, it just increases the total number of prairie dogs killed in the end. Okay. That's a lot. I'm sorry, Tom. <laughs> no, no, I, well, um, okay, Kurt. I mean, Dave, sorry. <laughs> so It uh, hasn't gotten late yet. <laughs> I, I have another general uh, concern. I, th I think in addition to scale, timing uh, is an important factor as well. And um, I guess I'm a little concerned ab about the preferred alternative in what I'm seeing is kind of a lack of a more definitive framework for accomplishment. And as an example, um, I think that our, our motion to council needs to recommend that there be action this year, so now. And so in addition to relocation, um, I think there needs to be either an administrative rule or um, emergency response action on the, on the part of council so that uh, lethal control can be uh, implemented this year and not. But my reading of the preferred alternative is that the, recommend, the suggestion from staff is that it doesn't start until next year. Um, I think that uh, given the exp expedited nature of this whole process and the use of the emer words emergency and crisis uh, would compel us to say that uh, we need an emergency response action while, in fact, we're looking at the ordinance revision, which will uh, presumably take longer time and, and may take, uh, you know, several months to a year to actually get get accomplished. Okay, so we have scale and timing. Uh, Hal, or? Yes. You look. Um, I, I uh, really respect uh, your direct approach on this. I plan to back up these suggestions <laughs> with some really well-reasoned work, but I'm just going to lay them Please. out. Please. That's what you <laughs> I'm going to re uh, request the removal of the conservation fund uh, contribution by the department. I'm going to recommend the, uh, I'm, I'm hearing from both sides on this issue that the borough destruction ordinance is problematic. I'm going to recommend a specific instruction to council on that. And I am also going to recommend that relocation um, be minimized to only the direct needs on the southern grassland as identified by OSMP staff and sourced only from OSMP managed lands, not least agricultural lands. Repeat the last phrase so I understand what you said. I'm, I'm going to be advocating that relocation is sourced only from OSMP uh, managed lands, not actively currently leased lands, mm -hmm. so basically to more quickly address the conflict we've been charged with addressing. I'll get into d uh, descriptions on all this, but those are the things I'm bringing to the table. Okay, thanks. Uh, Karen? Um. One of the changes I'd like to see is, um, oh, thank yeah. you, <laughs> is in addition to working with neighbors, working with lessees, which is not included currently in the draft, um, and I'm assuming that this is part of Hal's last recommendation, um, which is having a process to deciding whether there's room for more relocations in the southern grasslands. And then are, there are some questions that I have about the boundaries of the project area and the properties that are included. Um, 
Can you elaborate just, are you going to be proposing a change in the scope of this, either expanding or contracting, or is it more in the nature of clarifying? Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> 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 um, I haven't seen and don't have yet a list of removal and transition areas that are north of J Road. And I, I really want to see a list and maps so that I know what we're talking about. Um, and I'm also concerned about some of the properties that are right adjacent to the boundary, like the ones that have been marked on by IBM. Um, there, there's a property just south of the Black Cat Farm that's a... Uh, right, this is Be the Belgrove property. Yeah. Then, yeah. yeah, okay. So it's those kind of okay. adjustments, just to clarify that yeah. for you. Um, and then uh, I think there needs to be an addition to articulate what happens after this three-year start And I have uh, some other questions, but I think they're more in the second category that you've described. Okay. And then uh, some of what I would suggest has been covered by others, and then I wanted to raise the issue of the scope of the effort on trapping for ferrets um, and birds of prey. Uh, uh, my suggestion will be in terms of narrowing the mm -hmm. scope of that effort, um, not we're not going to propose eliminating it, but to narrow the scope of that effort um, in the belief that uh, it, it's a somewhat inefficient and difficult way to, for us to proceed. Um, all right, anything else? Dave. Yeah, th thanks. I'd like to just jump back in to highlight uh, what I think is a real important part of the kind of the three-year initial time frame, and that is that um, I think we need to make a, a more formal commitment to annual reporting uh, such that there's a, there's a, you know, a monitoring component, a, an assessment of monitoring, and then a, a potential adjustments so that there's an ongoing conversation with the community on where things are at and um, how, how it's working or, or what's not working or what is working. The other thing uh, for me is is um, kind of the uh, c the community conversation th that uh, w we need to put in context. It strikes me that w we, in our focus on irrigated lands, we really haven't discussed the the whole you know prairie dog issue very well or presented it. And so I think it's worth. Uh, coming back around to that context, especially when we go to council, and I'm thinking about, you know, the population levels of prairie dog on, you know, the grassland conservation areas or, you know, prairie dog conservation areas, so that there's that, you know, kind of understanding of, you know, the, the population dynamics of prairie dogs on the system. And then as we narrow that focus down to irrigated lands, then there's a, you know, a context for understanding what exactly uh, that looks like. Okay. I'm not sure whether this has already been covered. Uh, for instance, Tom, in what you suggested about the um, donations to the Raptor Recovery Center, but um, a couple of places in the draft, it talks about adding 20 acres of relocation, or... Um, uh, Karen, I believe that's 20 animals. Oh, 20. From well, Karen. 20 animals from other sources, but then there's another place where it advocates more relocations, a few more relocations. But th both of those elements... Um, 
Uh, I'd like to constrain. Right, so there's no question that there's going to be a discussion on the scope of relocation, um, okay. and there are clearly some who would like to see that uh, reduced, and we'll see how that discussion goes. But. Um, and, and I don't know whether this is covered by what Dave has already talked about, but um, I think it's really important if we're not gonna do any lethal control in the first year to at least do a trial of what the processes for lethal control are with one or more contractors. Okay. Okay, so this is obviously without, as we lawyers say, without prejudice to people adding further thoughts as we go along, but we gotta start somewhere and um, start biting off chunks of this. Um, a few of these clearly I think can be uh, grouped together. There's a, a number that relate to relo uh, relocation issues. Um, there's a couple that relate to uh, timing. Um, there's some sort of back end issues about post three year plans and annual reporting that we perhaps could at least discuss together even if they are <coughs> somewhat separate points. And, uh, <coughs> uh, well, I guess I'm going to ask of staff as we go th go through these. I think often the question is going to get sort of put back to you: of uh, is this something that, as you hear the discussion and where we're at, that you feel like you have enough direction to amend the plan in light of what we're discussing, or is this something where you really need some fairly specific? language and sort of structure around the concept. And I realize the answer to that question is probably going to vary from point to point, but I want to, you know, make sure you come out of this with enough direction in whatever form you need it. And please ask us if we're being ambiguous or you need clarification, let's, you know, Thank you. let's let's get that done. Um, so uh, in no particular order, I guess I'll suggest we start with what is the timing issue, um, so which is both uh, whether to have some lethal action this year and Karen's suggestion that at minimum we have a, a trial of the process. Um, uh, Maybe I should just, I know this was a subject that staff gave a fair amount of thought to, so do you mind sort of speaking to the, the practical realities of doing some lethal control this year of what you could and could not do so that, you know, we understand at least your thinking um, and why you decided to put off lethal control until 2021? I'll start in, and if others have um, anything to add, that'd be great. Um, but our general considerations around that, Tom, were budget, so we are not currently budgeted to do anything other than relocation this year unless you um, direct us to, to shift that funding. Um, the second uh, reason is that we, while we've done small amounts of lethal control as part of relocations, we have never done a program like this before, and we felt like it was going to take us some time to, uh, f uh, first of all, get the necessary permissions uh, legally to do to do it uh, under the wildlife ordinance and then also then develop the rfps and um, find the contractors that would uh, potentially do this and as we started to look at the timing on that we're already out uh, probably into the fall and at that point um, since we didn't have the funding this year was that something that would be better out in um, 2021 and that's that's the reason behind that i don't know if anyone has anything to add to that but that was sort of my recollection of our conversation around that. Can, can you talk a little bit about how many of those things you would do if you were to start lethal control in 2021? Well, um, all those things would be necessary prior to, we, we would be working on them in 2020 in order to start doing a lethal control program in 2021. So we, we would have to do all of those whether we start whether we were able to get something on the ground this year or next year. So, I, I feel like this question was asked prior. Um, we've we've determined that the department cannot be issued a permit under the president or ordinance as a stopgap until ordinance change. I'll ask Val to address that maybe. 
I don't want to touch it, but I want you to. Know. <laughs> um, it, it might be worth, I don't know if we could go to slide 70 in the extra slide, 6970, um, and pull it up. So, oh, that's, is that me? Uh, I don't think so. <coughs> Not you. But to answer your question in Can order. You maybe refresh that, because I don't think that's what's on my screen. So in order to move forward with the staff recommendation or choice C that's been put forward, we wouldn't need to change the ordinance per se. And so one mechanism that I've suggested is to draft a city manager's rule um, that describes the changes to irrigated agricultural land, so what lethal control would look like on these lands and the, the slide will be more helpful. Um, but the rule change would, would consist of posting the rule for 15 days, allowing public comment, making any changes, and then 15 more days before that rule could go into effect. So, so am I wrong, there is not a current, there is a lethal control permitting clause presently. I guess I'm asking why can OSMP not use that? Oh, so you're saying why not use a, a permit? A lethal control permit. For, until we can fix the, the larger right. structure. So that could be one mechanism under the, um, the city manager's ability to issue special use permits for lethal control for public projects or utility projects. So one way to look at that is you could say, OSMP is restoring this agricultural lane. That is our public project and we are looking for a lethal control permit for that project, a special use permit. And that this public process was a great public hearing under that permitting process for the discussion about it. Uh, so I'll just jump in and say I support um, encouraging council to look at those, to put this off an entire another year seems a real injustice to the expedited process. So, oh. I was just gonna say, so that's one mechanism to request a special use permit for a project. The other mechanism could be uh, establishing a rule that describes what the lethal control looks like in irrigated ag. Ooh. I'm sorry. That yep, that one's it. Um, so that would be an allowance um, under the aff affirmative defense of 6111, which describes lethal control limitations in the BRC. <coughs> I'd, I'd like to make one other quick comment on that. I really appreciated Eric Skokan's point. Um, the more that I think about this, I think it's fundamentally a regulatory issue. We're attempting to throw a lot of money at something that has created a problem that is legal. It's critical that we fix it correctly. Mm -hmm and it's gonna take time. And so I think it, rather than trying to rush council into some sort of an emergency ordinance, what we wanna do is see what, if we can begin work under the present permitting process and then encourage council to proceed carefully and thoughtfully through legal update. So if I understand you correctly, you're, you're suggesting to proceed with a change in the city manager's rule and then change the ordinance while that's going on? Or have I got that wrong? No, I, my understanding after reading the relevant documents is we have a current permitting process for lethal control, and no one has explained to me why the department can't utilize the current permitting process to begin this work. Yeah, and I think you're, I agree with you, and I think you're right, the department, the existing ordinance could be existing permitting process could be used, the city manager would have to make a determination that such a permit ought to be issued and obviously the views of this board would be, I would imagine, significant and certainly the views of council, uh, especially so, in deciding whether or not to actually issue the permit. But I think we could, if we wanted, to recommend pursuing that process while other, you know, perhaps broader changes are being considered. I'm seeing uh, at least, at the very least, well, probably all of us are nodding with that suggestion. Now, th there are some intricacies to that. Um, and so I guess I want to come back to staff and understand, uh, now I don't know how long that would take, particularly 
you know, the calendar year deadline is, you know, in some sense, maybe slightly artificial here. Um, what sort of guidance would you need from us uh, to uh, effectuate the concept that we've been discussing? Now, and let's put the money, mm. put that to the side for a second, just in terms of the structure of proceeding um, for a, to per, uh, obtain a special permit under the existing ordinance. What, what do you sort of need from us uh, to, yeah. and, and Tom, to indicate my, support for that? We, my reading of TAN is that that's sort of in the plan and we need to just confirm that's what they think okay. too. I think that's right. So, good, so it doesn't sound like you need a motion with a bunch of, oh, sorry Karen, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm still a bit confused about the difference between the rule change that Val was talking about and the permit that we're talking about, special permit that we're talking about now. We, um, yeah. <clears throat> so 99% um, of the time in the city of Boulder when lethal control happens, whether it's on public or private land, it goes through our very extensive lethal control permitting process. That's the right. process where there's a 90-day lag time. It includes a 60-day public comment. Um, and then the actual mechanism for lethal control is trapping the prairie dogs and donating them to an animal recovery program. That takes a couple of months easily because you trap until you're getting five clear weather days of no more animals in the trap. So you're trapping 95, 98% of the colony before you move into perk. That's how lethal control is usually done. There is something in the ordinance right now. There's only been two special permits issued for, in the history that I'm aware of, and that is um, for public improvement or utility projects. There can be a special use permit issued for lethal control if council has been notified what the project is, what the scope is. And so that is one way in our current ordinances to bypass that five, six month process of lethal control. We've only used that for Valmont Butte with the um, V Cup restoration project uh, years ago. What I was putting up before is a way to say, I mean, basically, when we want to change the way we do business, a city manager's rule is a way to be really transparent with that and say, <coughs> we're going to do lethal control differently than we ever have before in irrigated ag, and here's how we're going to do it. So the city manager's rule proposal would be a way to describe how you see lethal control happening on irrigated agricultural properties. And? And that's after it. it's described, right? So it's you. That rule would be posted for 15 days, and then it would go into effect. So, for example, it could say on irrigated ag, we're going to trap for five days, and then we're going to move to perk on our suite of irrigated agriculture properties north of Jay. So that rule would be an opportunity to describe exactly what you're doing as the lawful lethal mechanism for lethal control in that area, in that context. So Val, there's a, there's a two-track approach then. For the near term, you could do an administrative rule or a city manager's rule. Yeah, you could. Mm -hmm. And for the longer term, then, if there are ordinance revisions that are either necessary or desirable, yeah, that could go on a separate track. It could. I'm not sure what those would be at this juncture with the staff recommendation, but certainly any ordinance changes could happen in the same track if they were necessary. What I want to just make sure of from staff is, the one thing I would want to avoid is a situation where a fair amount of resources get put into sort of the, what I would call the track under the existing ordinance, and then by the, by the time anything actually happens on the ground, this sort of, the, what I would think of as the replacement process under the preferred alternative is then uh, come into play and we wonder, why, you know, why did we go through an enormous administrative process knowing full well that we were about to change the process. And so, to me, part of the answer to that is going to depend on, well, how much progress, for lack of a better word, would occur uh, if we were to, in a sense, have two tracks, one under the existing ordinance 
um, in the timelines that uh, have to occur under that relative to then picking up with um, any kind of process that came out of the uh, preferred alternative. Yeah, I don't want to just discover that for a week or two. It's like, okay, well, now the new process has come online and we've spent a ton of money uh, just, you know, kind of churning process. I think that's a really r reasonable pattern, but when I step back and look at this, if one branch of our city talking to another branch about getting a, a special permit issue is a huge amount of administration, we have much bigger problems in general. Um, and so... We, we, uh, I think that's my, my opinion. No, I'm not disagreeing. I, I'm just curious to get the answer so we get. The, well, um, <laughs> on number 10, Tom, we suggested three ways that we could go, go about doing this. If you want to narrow those down, um, that, that would be fine. If you want to put a time frame around that, that would be fine. Whatever, whatever you want to do um, to clarify on number 10 would be helpful. I think what we're saying is you folks need to explore this and exercise judgment as to what's going to get things happening on the ground the soonest. I think Tom's right. If we don't have any money, like you said, to do lethal control this year, is it worth spending a lot of time on getting a special permit or something like that? But I don't want to narrow those options. I want to tell you folks explore whatever would be useful to start making progress. And part of that is testing things uh, and learning. So yeah. it doesn't have to be large scale. So whatever you think is needed to at least get us moving up the learning curve. Uh, so you're nodding. I just want to make sure you, I, is that sufficiently specific? It, it, and and uh, yeah, that is, that is very helpful. Yeah. Okay. And, and can you just summarize that for us before <laughs> we go on so we know we've sort of put that to bed and we have in. a... Yeah. Understanding. Um, always a good practice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we we would uh, seek appropriate rule change, special permit or code changes, uh, likely on a parallel track to ex to expedite the uh, implementation of uh, the rest of the preferred alternative as immediately as possible. And Karen, since you had a suggestion on a trial of process, I want to be clear whether what's been discussed sort of can encompass your suggestion or do we need to flesh that out more specifically? In other words, do you see that kind of yeah, embedded within depends, this or do you want to yeah, it elaborate on, on that? Whether there's agreement on the need to do a trial in 2020 or, or as I see another option based on what John explained for staff to go through the process of defining what's needed, finding contractors, doing mm -hmm. all that background work to set it up <coughs> and, and get the permits to be ready to start in 2021 as opposed to doing all that background work starting in 2021. Yeah, yeah and, and really we, uh, again, as I mentioned before, the the um, the that table table uh, where where we talked about the cost and the time frame that was uh, all about just trying to give you an, a sense of what this would cost. If uh, we in the preferred alternative we, we didn't address timing, we we addressed the pol the policy issues. If you want to make uh, timing a policy issue, then you can insert it in any any place in this, uh, and and we would. Uh, respond to that as best we could. I think what, what we've heard too is that um, what we're doing is proposing to change number 10 with what you said really nicely, Kurt, but I didn't quite get it all <laughs> all down, was, was the notion of the, the reason that something would be an appropriate rule change, special permit or code change, would be to expedite our ability to implement the other actions on the list. Which could include uh, tests and you know trials and things like that. Right. I think it's also uh, fair to say that um, we're fortunate to have a, a, a great cross-departmental team working on this, and um, Val has already had some initial conversations with members of the city attorney staff, which led us to mm -hmm. um, bring this recommendation forward. So there's already some thinking going on about the most efficient ways to make this happen. We heard some uh, considerations from both the board and the public tonight, too, about 
wanting to keep things focused on resolving our issue without uh, making modifications to an ordinance that could have unintended consequences. We've heard some of that from the attorney's office too. So these are all real consistent ideas towards moving us uh, to, I think, a, a productive outcome for number 10. And to elaborate on Karen's point more generally, I would support um, being fairly adaptive. Um, I think it's just inherent in almost every aspect of this that there's going to be some uh, changes, some learning, some adjustments as we go along, um, including, you know, the more specific point that Karen was making, but uh, to me that's going to be a theme that inevitably is going to kind of over I know the, the county has done a lot of this and they have a lot of learning that we can benefit from, but I think within our own system, mm -hmm. there's going to be some adaptive learning that, you know, is beyond that general instruction is probably beyond our ability to crystal ball um, exactly what forms that will take. On the... I, I had a question just for Mark. Sure. <clears throat> Do you think there's any chance that when you go to council, you might have draft language at that point? That. We um, probably have to have our materials in draft form to council for their April 21st packet, the first full week in April. Yeah, that's pretty so quick. That might be a challenge. Okay. Yeah. Okay. On the, the budget issue, the first point that John made, um, it strikes me, but please correct me if I'm wrong, that the budget is heavily dependent upon when this is sort of ready to go, if it's not ready until, say, well and in, late into the fall, and just sort of given the limited amount of months remaining in the year, perhaps the total cost of it will be relatively small and the budget discussion is a little bit simpler. If it's going to be ready sooner, well, the, the dollars go up and the budget discussion uh, is going to be more complicated. But are you okay with, you know, recognizing we have to pay for any of this um, and that the budget process is about to begin, uh, you know, with first touches coming up, are you okay with deferring that for a little while until the, you know, the sort of future landscape of this becomes a little clearer and we have a better sense of the scope of it during uh, calendar 2020? In terms of, are you asking about revisiting what? Well, I mean, we're, yes. In other words, are you okay proceeding, recognizing that at some point you're going to have to come back to the board and say, all right, here's the scope that we're envisioning. Uh, here's how much that's going to cost in 2020. Where do you want to get the money from? Well, and it the, comes down to, I think, some of the other questions in, on here. If you, if you want us to uh, continue to include the relocation, that's what we have funding for this year. That's what we're, what's in the pipeline, what we're putting uh, permits together for and moving forward with. If you want us to shift off of that, that is a profound change of what's in the work plan and what we have already scheduled. Um, but that is, you know, I would look to Dan to whether that is something that um, we would want to start to I implement immediately or whether we want to stick to this idea around we kind of we kind of have a way to uh, start to budget for this in 2021 for whatever we end up with here. And we've started to uh, work that into our CIP, which we would be bringing forward to you next month. And um, that, that would be really the conversation is, does the 2021 budget line up with what you're asking us to do here? Can, can we, yeah. we have a lot of issues that pertain to budget. Maybe we can roll back on that, but it seemed like we were getting close to perhaps a agreement on the expeditiousness yes. and the desire to begin work. Right. And I just wanted to make sure the budget discussion isn't a precondition to that, and it sounds like we're going to have to cross that bridge, but... Yeah. yeah. Well... I, let me ask, what, before we leave uh, the ordinance changes and all that, we, nobody has mentioned yet borough destruction. Well, I was going to switch. I just want to make sure, because that, that was one of Hal's points. I just wanted to make sure we're done. Are we done on the, the timing issue, um, part of which implicates the ordinance, but then go discuss the specifics of um, you know, changing the ordinance? Okay. okay are we, I think we are perhaps done on the front end timing issue. 
It seems like there's no. general agreement. Okay, good. So do you want to speak to the, since it was, you were the one who first proposed it, the, um, the, the borough ordinance issue? This one is the lowest hanging fruit, the easiest one. Um, I have heard from all sides and all the most highly placed <laughs> stakeholders um, inclu including representatives from Prairie Dog Working Group, that this is an important part of non-lethal conflict, conflict mitigation. And so I defer to the community and their unanimity, excuse me, whatever it is, on this topic, and therefore I raise it. Okay. Uh, do you need any elaboration on this? I don't think so. No, we. <laughs> that's our, that was already a recommendation okay. uh, that we were directed to do through the Prairie Dog Working Group, and uh, but we can, and we considered it part of ten here as well. So you do. Okay. Yep. Great. That's important. All right. So, John, let me just ask: uh, Are you, or maybe Dan as well? Did, is this going to have to, are these kinds of uh, language revisions going to have to be part of the motion to council? Uh, or are, how, how are you envisioning kind of bringing that to council? So can I jump in on that? So my assumption, but you'll tell if, he's, if you think this isn't workable, is that after we've rolled through the various changes that we're proposing, um, that there'll be a motion to recommend the preferred alternative as amended by all of these changes, and that um, I mean, it's a fairly fast turnaround, but the document that goes to council will reflect these changes so that what we're recommending is the document that, in a sense, is to come, but will you know, reflect what we've agreed to. Um, and there may be other bells and whistles that we want to add that aren't specific uh, components of the preferred alternative, but are more general sort of aspirational and context setting. Yep. Is that your understanding? Is that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and um, that would be most helpful, I think. Um, on, but now to your points about the, uh, about code changes, I mean, we put this, we re recommended this number 10 in this order. So we would first try to do a rule change. If, <coughs> if that didn't seem to work, as um, uh, directly and efficiently as possible, we would go to a special permit or to a code change. Now, with respect to the borough, destruct the borough destruction ordinance, that might be one where we do a, we would do a parallel track uh, effort, which we could advance uh, as a result of of um, whatever council directs us to do. And just go directly to code change. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank okay. you for that clarity. We we can clarify that in what we take to council. Uh, John, it seems like that's sort of predicated on the possibility that for certain things related to lethal control, we may never need a code change. And I'm, uh, and, and I guess uh, I'm leaning towards proceeding on all tracks at the same time. Okay. That's, I don't know. Yes, I mean, I don't actually think you need a code change for borough destruction or for changing the way you do lethal control. I think they can both be done with rule changes. So I don't know that you would be doing a parallel cha track for what you're asking. So uh, let's explore that. Uh, one thing has been put forward is the idea of uh, allowing uh, lethal control by right on irrigated lands for open space. Mm. Could that be done by a rule change? No. Like, yeah. So I think yeah. you I think you proceed on all tracks at the same time. Okay. Okay. Um, another uh, sort of fundamental question, I think, and that Karen, this was yours, is the geographic scope of this. And so right. maybe you ought to elaborate on, I think you, you were actually sort of raising um, two separate issues. One was certain specific properties um, that you would add. I don't think you were suggesting subtracting any. I think it was just, just an add. And then the second was, and this was more informational, you needed a list of removal transition areas north of J. I think those are probably two related but different points. I'll let you maybe take them up in whatever order you, you yeah. wish, but I think um, why don't we tackle those next. I'd, I'd like to look at the map first on page 17 of the packet and ask staff about the property that's just south of J Road, just opposite the Black Cat Farm. And I can't tell you the ownership, ownership name of that 
property, yeah. but Is was there nice? reason to not include that? It's shown on that map. This is um, a map of the management areas. I can pull up the very map that you're talking about, too. Yeah, but it's just that little brown part down there. This is the... Yeah, this is Bell Grove. Yeah, the, the property... I can maybe try to zoom in on this, too, just see if that... Yeah. It wasn't included because the, the boundary of the project area was defined by J Road. And others across the diagonal that showed up as included are part of another leasehold. The Belgrove property is not leased, therefore it wasn't attached to a leasehold inside the project area. Yeah. So this is when you're, if you're heading north on 47th, when you hit J Road, it's the property on the southeast corner of that intersection? Correct. Right? Yeah. 47th Street. To yeah, I've never south of J Road. I mean, other than coyotes and prairie dogs, I don't know that I've ever seen any. You know. Yeah, I mean, I would suggest that uh, there's a lot of work to be done inside this blue line, and we can certainly come back after a year of this, after two years of this, and reassess: is this the right area still to be working in? The conditions on the ground are going to change over this time period, and that's why it's so hard for us to look out much past beyond one or two years on this. So I, I would just uh, ask that you consider, and you know, to, to Dave's point of sort of an annual reporting or annual check-in on this, that 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 might be the best way to get to what you're after on. And, on um, and if I could elaborate, just given the, the realities of this, the properties like Axelson Johnson or Boulder Valley Ranch alone are gonna occupy you all and us for some time to come. So I'm not sure if we could add a property, it would just be an administrative action. I'm not sure it's ever getting, in the next few years, it's not gonna get high enough on the list of priorities that it for it to make. Action. So that's, if you're okay, okay. okay. Then, what do we, sorry. and then so your other, um, and the same with the, the other property that was mentioned was McKenzie, but that would be, that's even one sort of, that's the next, property south, and so I would think the same. East. East. East yeah. It's on the other red side line. of the diagonal. Uh, yeah. One showing in red here on the map. Mm -hmm. And are those both both removal and transition? Transition. Yeah. The yeah, so Belgrove property is a transition area, and Mackenzie is removal. removal. Yeah. Okay, um, did, did you want to elaborate on your, the other geographic issue you said was you wanted a list of removal and transition areas. Is that just an information request that staff could respond to offline or is there a sort of a policy decision that flows from it for this meeting? I would just say, so we have a map here and we have a list of acres. We don't have a list available tonight of individual properties. I wasn't aware that that was desired. Okay, and what about the issue of the language in the document about managed versus irrigated as opposed to removal versus trans... Yeah. So, um, I apologize for any confusion this has caused. Open Space and Mountain Parks has property interests in uh, areas that we do not actively manage uh, on the ground. These include conservation easements, mm -hmm. Uh, areas that we have, through agreements with the county, um, determined that the county will manage joint, jointly owned properties. So by open space managed, what we are talking about is the subset of the open space lands that we actively manage. This includes mostly fee properties, but it also includes examples like Sawhill Ponds and Mesa Reservoir, which we lease from the Colorado Division of Parks and Wildlife. It also includes a couple of conservation easements, which by virtue of the agreements we made at the time of acquisition, we do manage. So that isn't a, a term that's meant to differentiate anything about whether it's irrigated or not. Right. The lands that we lease to uh, tenants are open space managed lands. <coughs> lands that uh, we irrigate or that are irrigable on these maps are open space managed lands. So it's not managed versus irrigated. Not at all. Yeah. Man can can we 
can we stick to removal and transition as designations of the priority? I'm just confused as always. I, I've done this in so many meetings, it's not funny, <laughs> about which properties we're talking about. So and I think I the public's clarify, confused too. I'll clarify one point from, from Mark. Um, we did take a much closer look at our irrigable land coverage and we created definitions for what we call historically irrigated and currently irrigated. And I think in some of the previous maps we made early in this process, some of the historically irrigated properties were shown as irrigable lands. And when we made this latest set, we had created a definition that if the land hadn't been irrigated in the last 10 years, it would be called historically irrigated versus irrigable. That doesn't necessarily change the goal for the property. Any agricultural land that we bought with water rights, we do want to maintain irrigation on. Um, I think it just, it kind of gets to the attribute table of what irrigable land is defined. There, there isn't any intention to change irrigable land to non-irrigable land. Okay, so just to stick with that for a minute to get a little bit more clarity. If it's a historically irrigated land and it's in the removal or transition categories, then is it still a priority for removal? Um, we would use um, other criteria as well. So if the irrigation infrastructure is ready to go, those would be higher priority. I know it's not, it's not really clear. I mean, we have- I just think we have for this plan to be clear, uh -huh. we need to address that. And clearly we're not gonna do it right here, right now. But I think that's a point of confusion that needs to, in the final document that goes to council, needs to be crystal clear. Yeah, and Andy, I think you, you have a language issue where historically <laughs> irrigated, you know, so the question is, well, what does that mean other than that it was irrigated at some point in the past? You know, wh why is it not irrigated currently? And what's so that's happened one. To the water rights. Right, sure. and so that's one. The other one is when you s say irrigable, or when one says irrigable for lands that are irrigated, it strikes me that what you really mean is irrigated land. So why, because the confusion is, is that irrigable has some potential association with it. It either could or could not, you know. It, it, potentially it could be, but the question is whether it is. And so if it's irrigated land, we ought to say it's irrigated land. Yes, Andrew. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I wouldn't want you to sort of rewrite everything. There's a lot of maps and things, but I will say just conceptually in my mind, there's irrigable, it refers to potential. There's currently irrigated, and then there's previously irrigated, which, right. but no longer. Um, and then there's all, there's other lands, which, you know, were since never irrigated. Um, I, I don't want to sort of dictate what could be a big rewrite, but at least conceptually. Well, yeah, I, I think we have cleared it up. I, okay. I think I intentionally used the word irrigable when it has been changed to irrigated, as Dave suggests. Okay, okay. That, that does, there is a historically irrigated category. We have some formerly irrigated land that we didn't buy your water rights with. Um, so that's why it shows up as historically irrigated because we don't want to lose the opportunity to move water there at some point. Right. So that's one reason for the category. Yeah. Without redoing all the maps, yeah. I don't think it would be too hard to come up with a list of all the parcels that qualify in the project area because that's a domain that everybody's interested in Council's interested in. I, yeah, I assume it's embedded within some of the calculations that you've been doing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. easily available. It's actually available in GIS data online for the public, but I mean, that's something I could do very quickly. Okay. We just hadn't awesome. prepared I think that, that would help clear it up. We have a table. Okay, so I think with that, um, Hal, do you want to talk about removing the conservation fund? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Get to wear both the conservationist and technocrat hat. I heard that from another board member. Forgive me <laughs> for being a technocrat for a moment here. I've spent a lot of my life advocating for additional conservation funding. Um, the open space 
uh, department is the most illustrious conservation organization that I've ever had the privilege of working with. Um, my argument for this uh, is relatively straightforward. Um, we, in our grassland plan, set up a pocket of occupation that we were seeking on our grasslands. That pocket was 10 to 26 percent occupied. Currently, we're at 31 percent. I want to honor some people who did not come tonight because of uh, concerns about health um, and some private phone calls that we had that really got into some detail on this um, that told me, well, it's, we, we understand we're past our targets on the system, but we have prairie dogs in the north and we don't have enough in the south and that's why relocation is important. And I found myself convinced by those arguments. It's possible that we are over our full target, but perhaps some of our prairie dogs are in the wrong place. Um, th that, that comes into the further discussion of relocation, which we'll return to, but strictly back to the funding. Um, we, there was a, a slated $600,000 reallocation in the current plan. And what this boils down to in my mind is and, and what I told these individuals on the telephone call, I want to be able to promise those people if we ever get to a place where we are towards the bottom end of this number, that we will show up with money, commitment, and help to ensure the prairie dogs' long-term survival in our system. In my view, the only way we can achieve that is that once we have done such strong conservation work and we have such a viable population which is growing organically and is past our department's own wisely considered targets, that is a time where we need to reduce funding in that area so that our conservation projects in other areas for other imperiled species, other elements can be done. In short, reserving the money for a grasslands conservation fund uh, strikes me as us not trusting our department to be a general repository for best practices in conservation. So by no means is it a communication of not being interested in conservation. It's really a view of how we maximize our department's ability to respond with money and with effort at key moments across our whole system to do an absolutely excellent job at conservation. I'm going to close by saying I really think the Prairie Dog Working Group uh, should take a lot of credit for this huge victory. We've blasted through these targets, and that, that is my feeling on that one. Yeah, I, I come to the same conclusion. In the, um, certainly in the master plan, uh, a lot of the highest funding priorities would be consistent with the objectives of the conservation fund, and I don't see that we need to create a separate sort of bucket of money. Uh, we're going to have to, year over year, make decisions about you know how specifically to allocate money, but we're always going to be putting large amounts of money towards conservation issues. And I think sort of, it's almost like taxing yourself, like a forced savings program that, uh, like how it is, it's almost some sense slightly anti-democratic to sort of say, well, we're going to constrain ourselves. I'd rather say, well, we're going to trust um, ourselves in the future to allocate and spend money based on the priorities and the needs as they, as they come about. Um, and I guess I also fundamentally you know, I don't mean this in any disrespect to the Paradox Working Group, but think that open space ought to have control over our funds and not sort of put them in a different bucket that isn't entirely ours. Yeah, and, I, and again, it was with no way denigrating the objectives, but just sort of at a structural level. Can I just clarify, the Prairie Dog Working Group recommendation had to do with setting up a grassland conservation fund, and the intention of that was to receive funds from outside entities, whether it was private landowners doing mm -hmm. lethal control or nonprofits who wanted to donate for conservation in the city. Um, so this was using their recommendation for this purpose, but they had not directly recommended that this happen from open space into the fund. Mm -hmm. So but, monetarily, Heather, what, what I'm looking at is that it's about 100000 dollars a year so 300,000 or you know over 3 years and it just strikes me agreeing with what both Hal and and Tom has said that that money could be most effectively used on the ground in the moment and so I, I guess I'm I'm wondering why we're paying the, or giving money to the planning department so that 
you know, they, we, we can then get the money back to do what we were going to do in the first place. Um, so I, I agree. I, I w was somewhat perplexed by that. If there's no one that wants number 11 on this, we will put an X through it and take it out. Okay. That's the easiest thing we can do this Done. evening. <laughs> Yeah. All right. We've done 10 and 11. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, how about, uh, Karen, you had made a point about working with... Uh, lessees. Lessees. Do you want to elaborate on the specifics of your suggestion? In the uh, plan on page 31... Um, in the top right-hand box, it says work with neighbors to reduce likelihood of recolonization. Yeah. But I don't find anywhere work with lessees. And one example that came to mind uh, both yesterday and tonight has to do with the fact that if um, prairie dogs are being removed on land that I'm leasing, and that I want to see reclaimed to a, a hay meadow, just giving you an example, um, why can't I, as the lessee, go out on that land once the prairie dogs have been cleared, no matter what method is used, and do the, the uh, tilling of the burrows, putting up the fence, with my farm equipment that I have right there, rather than have a contractor come in, which is what I saw it out on the land yesterday, um, doing it. Doing it exclusively. I mean, you'd probably do both, but you're saying we should enable lessees to if, contribute. Well, if there's a lessee, a current lessee for that land, why would we not give the lessee the money to get the job done with their equipment on the land that they've leased, rather than contracting it out to somebody who's hauling stuff from Denver or Fort Collins or wherever to do the work. Yeah, I think it depends on the action that would be taken. Um, we've somewhat taken the position that we don't want to burden them with reclaiming land because of our policies. Um, I think we are willing to, to pay them to do the work if they're interested in doing so. Um, most of the reclamation work is being done by our staff that's being hired. We are contracting to do compost application, but by and large, uh, the reclamation or restoration activities are being done by our staff. Well, at least a couple of lessees have said to me, why can't we do that? So sure. I think there's that. at least some interest. I think we can make modifications to the language throughout the document to clarify that our lessees and tenants are um, stakeholders and where we make references to neighbors or to, you know, coordinating and uh, coordinating, making sure that those references include our lessees. There, we didn't mean to omit that. It's sort of just our general way of doing business. Yeah. So I would uh, second Karen's suggestion and your way of implementing it and add um, this is a point Paula Schuler made to me, that, uh, uh, but correct me if you think it's incorrect, that a lot of our lessees are also county lessees and therefore have a fair amount of experience. And now, that doesn't mean our approach will be the same as the county's, but it does mean they do at least if have some installed base of knowledge and presumably there will be you know, some similarities in approach, that there is some experience and expertise that could be usefully tapped into. So to expand on that, I think and to be really clear that we're talking about lethal tenants possibly doing lethal control. Well, I wasn't going that far yet. I know you yet. weren't, but I, <laughs> but that's, but I think, that's another part of the discussion. Yeah, I, I think uh, when you talk about the tenants and or operators and their abilities to, you know, assist or cooperate in management, then we ought to look at kind of that full spectrum because many of them are trained you know, by the county to do that anyway. And so it's like, well, if that's what we want, then presumably they can do that. And I think at this point that's not explicitly included because this is such a new 
direction for us to go as staff that coming up with any type of a framework around how lessees would be involved when we're not even sure how it's going to go for us is really premature. You know, the county's program is really based on after they have fully cleared a property, then lessees would be involved in keeping it clear. And that may be something that we're very much looking at. Building that back end after lethal control is obviously a follow-up implementation item that has to happen, how that monitoring happens, how any follow-up lethal control happens. And that may very well involve lessees, and we'll certainly be evaluating that. It just seemed pretty premature to commit to anything like that when we're, we're quite a few steps away from that at so the point. So does a general uh, sort of suggestion to include working with lessees um, suffice to address your concerns and provide you at least, I, I, don't th I think I, that's guidance you probably already were assuming, I, but. I, I just want one clarification yeah. on that. I, I, I am not understanding to say that we make this a requirement of the lease. What no. I'm hearing no, no, is no, no. Each, right. we, we would treat them like a contractor in this right. instance. Okay. I, I think you can craft a As positive. opposed to a, a, some distant contractor who's right. not currently on the land. I think you can craft a positive statement about the program will continue to look for opportunities for lessees to contribute. It doesn't mean we're going to do it for things that are inappropriate at that stage or that time, but we will keep open to it and be looking for ways to involve them uh, as a, just a general affirmative statement. I think that's true. And uh, if there are a, a couple of examples uh, where, you know, might be, you know, in the consideration, I think that would be helpful. Yeah. Just one quick comment on that. Uh, Mark, you're opening today about the graceful solution related to uh, the agricultural community helping us keep water rights and participating in the uh, department's goals, I think is the, the for me, uh, the really critical part of this. We talk about public-private partnerships all the time. We talk about stewardship. And for me, it's really critical, critical, perhaps even more critical, that those things come to bear in the conversation at the really hard moments so the weight of these heavy decisions is shared with our lessees. Uh, I, I just think that we don't want to make this some separate issue which is perceived as a service that we somehow provide. This is a, this is a shared right. struggle and, and, and one with a lot of remorse. And I think we want, we want to make that into part of this public-private partnership. Okay, so now I'm getting a little bit confused about whether we're making it a a requirement of the lease that they do some of this work. I, I, I don't think it needs to go that far. Certain okay. people probably won't do that. But as far as us creating this culture of continuing what Mark talked about, which okay. is harmonious partnership with lessees on all of our work, not just the easy parts, but the hard parts too. Okay. And if there are parts that can be uh, contracted to the lessee, before the contract goes out, there's a consultation, and here's the checklist. Would you like to do some of those things yourself? And therefore, we won't get the bid on that part of the job. Okay. okay. Um, so I, I think we're good on, good on that. Uh, so uh, trapping for ferrets and other, uh, and raptor recovery, could you elaborate on, you know, that's a fairly, signif fairly significant component of this in terms of money and the way the lethal control is structured. Could you elaborate on, you know, your reasoning for uh, sort of why you wanted to make that the kind of the starting point? Yeah, I would ask Heather to address that. Okay. Sure. So sort of through the history of the conversations about lethal control within the city, that has been seen as sort of a, a more... Um, palatable type of lethal control because there was a feeling that those prairie dogs were still contributing to some ecological purpose in either supporting raptors that were being rehabilitated or black-footed ferrets um, that were being raised for release back into the wild. So, um, for instance, the six-step um, process um, within the city's um, ordinance <laughs> um, starts with trapping and donating, and you need to kind of exhaust that before you move to in borough, where the thought is that kind of there's no benefit there to the ecology, the, the grander ecology. Um, and so that was kind of the thought behind that, is that's kind of been the tradition within Boulder. It's kind of been the way that it's been approached by the community and by city council in the past. And so we were kind of seeing it 
unless things have really changed as a more a more palatable form of lethal control for a lot of community members. So, um, do those organizations have a you know a, a shortage of prairie dogs now? Yes, they do. They will take any that we would give them. So, do we have an estimate of the relative cost of? trapping and donating a prairie dog versus lethal control. Yeah, I do have a slide that kind of breaks down the the budget a little bit more just to show you what component of it is that trap and donate versus the perk. So that might be helpful. It's probably in the 50-ish okay. range. Do you remember what it might be called? I, uh, it just says like budget breakdown. I know. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll find no, it. No, it's way down. It's like, in, it's like 50. Okay, we'll find it. While Mark is looking, well, I, I so think what we're foot, struggling. Oh, I was going to say, isn't that the footnote on page 34? It's the, uh, I think it's the one, two, three, four, fifth bullet, $4,000 per acre for trap and donate, right. and $221 per acre for perk. So in, in simple numbers, it's about 18 or 19 times more expensive to trap and donate versus, I mean, that's not surprising that it's much more expensive to trap and donate than yeah. to just kill them in their burrows. Um, I realize there are pros and cons to both of those things, um, but I think that that's how I, at least the math I got off of that bullet suggested about a 19-fold factor. Yes, that, that, that's definitely okay. true. And if you wanted to see kind of in the full three-year budget how much of a component each of those held, I can work with Mark. If not, we won't let him stop mm -hmm. scrolling through the too many slides. If, so, if that's Heather, do we have experience in trapping and donating? We don't. No, we certainly, I mean, a lot of the contractors that we have used have trapping experience, and some of right. them for other clients have also done donation, but no, we have not done it. Heather, just a technical question. I heard on the phone, and I wanted to confirm with a staff member, um, that trap and donate does not require delta dust, only relocation. Can you confirm that? That is true in the case of donation to a raptor facility, yeah. which is what we're proposing. If they're going to the ferret center, it does require delta dust. Yeah. And that's why you've used raptor in this proposal, right? Raptor donation. That's part of it. There are other logistical issues with the ferrets in that you need to have a holding facility to yep. keep them alive yep. and then transport them up in groups up to the ferret facility. So um, just from a lo logistical standpoint and from a cost perspective, there are additional pieces there for the ferret donation. So what you're proposing is strictly raptor yeah. donation. That's what we had included, yeah. yeah. So I think what we're struggling with, obviously, is how we can provide a, a, a way to maybe let others fund that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there you go, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> is this our t turn to applaud or? <laughs> <laughs> I think minor victories. Um, I think we're looking for ways to make this program as efficient as possible because we're afraid that even as it's scaled, it will not do the job, that the population will get out of our uh, control, and we'll be ending up both wasting a lot of money and killing a lot of extra prairie dogs. Um, so what I would suggest is that we do the amount of relocation that's needed to support the southern grasslands, and that's going to be determined by our staff. But beyond that, while we would let other groups come in and fund and do uh, trapping for whatever purposes, that that not be part of this program. We not prohibit it. It's just not we're going to divert 18 to 1 uh, ratio of cost to that because it just lengthens out the program that may already be a lot longer than we think it will be. Um, I, I feel like, um, Lindsay, would you come up just briefly? You sent us some information about cost. Will you talk to us about that a little bit? I, there was doubt cast on the $4,000 number, and I want to give people an opportunity to talk about that quickly. So I just have costs for wild-to-wild -wild relocation. You're talking about relocation for raptors and ferrets, which we don't do. Well, I thought... I, I thought our relocation cost is for a prairie dog to go from the wild to the wild, not to a raptor or ferret recovery And, and program. that's less expensive. Wow. Okay. That's interesting. Okay. All right. Thanks. So again, I think we want to do the relocations that we need to support prairie dog conservation. Uh, but beyond that, it just seems like it's diverting resources from a ever-growing problem. So can somebody quickly do the math for me and tell me if we did 
if the 213,000 were all perk, it would be how many more prairie dogs? It was about a thousand acres. Um, I mean, from from a policy standpoint, we are going to do this as mo as efficiently and as cheaply as we possibly can. We're going to seek competitive bids and get the prices down as much as we can. the The question was not if if you if you want to change the acreages that we have here that to me is the is the policy question yeah. we we will try to do that as at the least cost that we possibly can and if we can find somebody who will do it for half the cost we will employ them if they are, are um, legitimate contractors that can can uh, contract with the city but in terms of it, the best guidance i think that you could give us is is this the right amount of lethal control to be doing. Uh, well, I think what I was talking about was do we want to incorporate trapping for the Raptor program? And okay. what I'm saying is I don't think that should be our priority. I think relocation to support prairie dog conservation is an important priority as determined by staff who keep tracking the uh, number that is needed and can be ecologically absorbed into the southern grasslands or elsewhere. Having other groups pay for that or do it, I think is fine. I just, I, I hate to divert program resources to that, to the uh, Raptor program trapping. How can you go back? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's where I come. I admit this is, a t this is a tough one and I get the idea that just killing them um, seems like a missed opportunity compared to killing them in order to feed it to a Raptor. I realize from the prairie dog's perspective, uh, I assume trapping and feeding and killing it and feeding it to a raptor is actually worse than perk, that we think perk is, uh, I don't love the word humane, but in this context, because let's face it, you're just killing wildlife. To me, it's not, none of it's very humane. But regardless, it is the least painful or unpleasant to the prairie dog to use perk rather than be trapped and go through the, you know, the terror of that and then get killed anyhow. So I'm not sure we're doing the prairie dogs any favors by feeding them to a raptor. It's really a question of what's the status of the raptor program? Uh, and is there a meaningful ecological gain here um, in terms of the health of our, you know, broad, broadly speaking, the, ra the raptor population? And I admit I don't have a great handle. I know how our own raptors are doing because you report on that every year and on the whole it's been doing pretty well. Um, and I am, con you know, I understand the issue also that if you trap the prairie dog outside the hole, then you've, in a sense, You've really targeted what you're trying to do, whereas if you put perk into the hole, there may be other, into the burrow, I should say, there likely are going to be other animals in there that you didn't intend to kill, but they're all, you know, collateral damage here. And so the more targeted specificity of live trapping does have some advantages, but boy, it comes at a pretty high price. Um, I don't um, so, so probably just looking for a reaction to how we see this, but I have a th Well, I'm sort of hearing that in, for number four, which we don't have fully um, mm -hmm. presented up there, but it's on page 27, what I'm hearing is taking out the trapping for a week and donating to the Raptor Center as a possible idea that you're thinking about right. here. And I think we're, for the moment, at least not answering the question, does the money that's freed up from that go to just savings from the program, or does it go to expanding acreage? Right, and that's... I, I know you, you'd like an answer to that, but at least for the moment, we're saying, well... Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, so as a, as a policy, do we want to be transferring animal, uh, dead, uh, dead prairie dogs to the raptor center, trapping them and sending them to raptor center. And I think we're suggesting it shouldn't be a priority. Right. Okay. Just so that those monies can go right. to removal, okay. uh, to do that as quickly as we possibly can. Well, that's right. Is that, um, is, are we all in agreement on that or? Okay. Uh, so another component of that, again, and this was around 
balancing conservation with uh, with the lethal control. Another was if we had additional receiving sites, say in the southern grasslands, or that somebody else brought into us, would we want to do any trapping in those lethal control areas before we brought the perk in? Well, I think it is a priority for us to meet our own program needs for prairie dog conservation. Now, I, you sort of lost me when you said when somebody else brings. Well, if we if we had another site such as, um, you know, I'm not going to suggest one, but um, if if there was another location that was not on OSMP property that someone made available to us, would we and that we could legally move them to right. Yeah. yeah, well, I believe that in 2019, this board said that we were in an emergency situation and we got in this situation because of years of doing that kind of work instead of minding the problem on OSMP land. And so for me, I think we need to stick with that decision and that priority of we need to spend our staff time and our resources on prairie dogs that are on OSMP land that need to be removed from OSMP land and other agencies or private parties need to spend their resources on taking care of their problems because this is our priority now. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think we're transitioning here. I just want to make sure. Are, it's a separate issue. Yeah. Are you at... Are you clear on the the trapping for raptors issue yes. before we transition to trapping for relocation? Was, it yes, was in, I am. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I think this is a fundamental question of uh, we have. I will say I support the staff proposal in terms of the volume of relocation that you're that you're proposing. I get that you know relocation is more expensive than perk, but I also think first that uh, increasing uh, prairie dog populations on the southern grasslands, which are, you know, I say are currently at three percent, is an important goal. I think it's also something that the public uh, will expect of us for the time being. You know, uh, granted, as we said in a Karen's right, uh, relocation is not the complete solution to this, and I think we're unanimous in believing that lethal control needs to be added to the, as a tool in the toolbox, but I would, speaking for myself, keep the relocation as another tool that we use in approximately the volumes that are called for um, in the uh, staff preferred alternative, which, you know, admittedly over the long run is dependent upon the availability and quality of receiving sites. But I think for the time being, there's no shortage in the southern grasslands that's going to operate as a constraint. You know, perhaps there will someday, but at this, at this point, um, we have ample places to receive on our own lands. So, is everyone. Now, Karen, you were talking about should we be back in the business of taking prairie dogs from other properties and using the southern grasslands to relocate them? I thought that that's what John was describing. No, no, I was talking about um, on the on the the sending sites where we would do lethal control instead of trapping to send them to the Raptor Recovery Center if we had other relocation sites on our property or on somebody else's property where we would send them to, not take them from, but where we would, where we could put them, if we had those locations available, would you want us to trap in the lethal control areas before we um, brought the perk machine in? That, that I, I'd comment on that, I, especially if it's another public lands organization, conservation group that wants them and needs them badly enough that they'll participate in cost sharing, I think go. it's a delightful thing to look at. Okay. I, I don't see how we can fund that ourselves entirely. I agree. Right. And to Are we talking about more than the 40 acres yeah. that would described be, in here? Yes. Yeah. Yep. If there are additional receiving sites from some other organization, and I agree with oh. Al, if they're willing to cost share right. that or if we or if we had additional sites available we, it, it was an option that we put in here again seek trying to seek a balance between 
prairie dog conservation and lethal control. Right. But I just want to be clear whether if that's something you don't want in this, then we can take it out. If it's um, something that you would like us to have in the arsenal, um, then we would leave it in. I'm really eager to go to the question of scale because I think yeah. our answer to the question of scale and what our priorities are for addressing the population problems is a predicate to what you're describing. Okay, All right, and, and that's what I was trying transitioning to and speaking in favor of was the, at least on the relocation side of it, the scale that's set forth and the preferred alternative. I was and am supporting that. And and you pointed out yeah. that that's always going to depend upon the availability yeah. of receiving right. sites. So. It's going to be up to staff to decide what we need and what we can accommodate to support our larger prairie dog conservation mission. Right. So, John, to relocate in, in areas that were targeted for lethal control, which is what you're asking, yep. it just strikes me that, you know, relocation is, is more expensive, more time consuming, and um, I, I guess uh, I would have a hard time kind of with that. I think if we do the target 40, 100, uh, that makes sense. Okay, that's helpful, Dave. Okay. It's fairly big. Are we in agreement on those, no, okay. those numbers? You know, with all the caveats around needing to be adaptive and the availability of lands. Number four. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and I would say if somebody comes and wants some of our prairie dogs and wants to cost share, that that's applied to the 40 target number. Okay. Rather than some additional number. And I, I just wanted to remind, because we were briefly touching on this, but I don't want to get diver badly diverted onto it. We did a year ago address the question of the priority at our receiving sites for our prairie dogs relative to prairie dogs that might come from Parks and Rec or from a right. development project. We had a very specific motion to council that we wanted top priority as long as there was any leasehold that was more than 35% occupied on a, I think it's per acre basis. Right. Um, that was extensively discussed in council. I think they, in general, uh, were supportive, maybe not at quite as strictly as our proposal was, but and then we were directed uh, in the, uh, particularly with regard to Valmont City Park, to eventually down the road, you know, speak with Parks and Rec and see if we can work out any differences. Given that that's already gone to council, my inclination is to leave it be, recognizing we have previously emphasized our own view about the importance of giving priority to our um, sending sites under certain levels of irrigated ag occupation. It, yes, and, and the, so with one exception, we did not touch that in the preferred alternative. Yeah. The one exception is number three, and um, where we were suggesting a minor um, alteration to that direction. And it, why? Um, be, and Val, would, would you? To help Val. So, yeah, <laughs> pretty much that's why I'll take the mic. And I don't know if it's worth putting slide number 71 up for this. But so sometimes in urban areas, and for 2020, the, the circumstance that has arisen is there's a utilities project along the Goose Creek where the um, Goose Creek trunk sewer needs to be replaced and repaired, and so it's above ground disturbance in an area that we're gonna do passive relocation for about 70 animals and 200 burrows. So that's just kind of showing that, mm. no, it's showing nothing. Mm. <laughs> no, because that's... Um, anyway, so when we do this uh, passive relocation project like we have planned, we expect that all the prairie dogs can be passively relocated, um, but because we're doing 3.4 acres of mitigation in this 27 acre area in some strip air, thin areas, it's possible that some of those prairie dogs will not be passively relocated and that won't be successful. So it's possible, though I think the passive will work, that up to 20 animals aren't gonna get out of their holes when it's time to dig up the ground for the sewer replacement. So that's why I was requesting for these very small number 
of um, relocations from other city projects like this 2020 project where we've seen where it's along a bike path or where people, hundreds of people are passing these animals every day and, and form some kind of relationship. When we say we're doing lethal, it has a very big impact. So the request came from that balance of it's a, in the context of the 1,164 prairie dogs that we expect will be relocated from open space irrigated ag, these up to 20, we could be talking about five animals, um, would not disrupt the effectiveness, but would, would make a big difference in the urban context of mitigation projects. Yeah. That's why that's in there. It's fine with me. I mean, 20, up to pra 20 prairie dogs is frankly a rounding error in what yeah. we're talking about here. I mean, not to be cavalier, but it is. If you and so, and I think to the extent there's another important city priority that can be accomplished at those low numbers, I don't think that fundamentally defeats the idea that our receiving sites ought to overwhelmingly be for uh, solving open space problems. If you think 20 is going to do something. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I would agree. Uh, Thomas, but I then, look at my... But then what? I mean, are we saying whenever the, another department has a need, they come to us and we'll say, oh, okay. You're saying on an annual basis, if there's a small scale urban project up to 20 <coughs> animals, that that would be okay. And I think council direction was to basically negotiate. If that arises, to discuss it with whatever the department is and better understand and their ask. needs and our needs and not get uh, entirely absolute about this. And Karen, there's a caveat. If receiving sites are available. So up to 20 if the receiving sites are available. So it's the combination. And we get first crack at the receiving sites for the relocations that we're doing. Right. I think I can come along with that, but I'd like to be convinced that um, when, when you say are available, it doesn't strike me as a conservation need that's well considered. I'd like to be doing this when we know we have a conservation goal and we're not hunting and looking for places. I just want to clarify that the um, relocation criteria within the grassland plan are based upon that. So if, we're, if we meet our relocation criteria for grassland preserves, we have that conservation need. If we don't so have So available does need, mean that. It, it, it does mean that it meets the, the relocation criteria, which is based on those conservation goals. Thank you. This but is the we're already oh, exceeding the maximum, right? Mm. Not even close in the southern grasslands. It's on a it's on a grassland by grassland preserve by grassland preserve basis. So our conservation goals are 10 to 26 percent in grassland preserves of prairie dog occupancy. We would relocate up to 10 percent to meet that lower threshold for our conservation goal for that grassland preserve. So right now, southern grasslands is at just over 3 percent. So we've got a long ways to go to be at 10 percent. And do we know the expectations of open space staff uh, on these kind of ancillary relocation efforts? In, in other words, are, is there some role for open space staff or, or are the relocations entirely done by whomever is doing them? Well, they'd likely, when we've done this in the past, where prairie dogs have come from other city lands or other private lands, um, they are paying for the relocation. It has to be under our relocation permit because we're the landowner with the receiving site. So that coordination has to happen. And usually we work with the contractor directly on the receiving site end, so on the release right. end, and they work with the contractor on the capture or sending site end. I'm looking at my checklist, and Hal, you said something earlier about relocation that maybe I would have you revisit. I think you were saying you felt most comfortable having the relocations only be from non-irrigated lands, and are you still there, or did I get this completely no, wrong? Uh, not non-irrigated. Um, my proposal is, is that we do reloca relocation on OSM, and this we're back to that OSMP managed confusion, yeah. back to non-leased OSMP lands first. When, do you mean the, the lands that were previously irrigated or that staff is now irrigating? Wait, no, rather no, than no, no, I think what it means, like if they go to the southern grasslands, can we put them on lands that aren't under a lease? No, no, uh, nothing. Okay. This, is sending, this is a sending issue, it's, not a right, let, let, let me be very specific. The packet said that 66 approximately percent of the acres in the study area are currently leased. That means there's 33% up there that is unleased. 
I'm suggesting that we do relocation on the 33%, not the 66%. To put it in simple terms, this is the issue of whether the Bennett property, as an example, gets priority relative to Axelson Johnson as an example, which is the higher priority, something that is. Is it, that correct, Hal? Is that what you're thinking? Because doesn't that cut, doesn't that cut against doing well, the places that are the biggest current conflict? Right. The, um, the problem is is that what I've consistently heard from the agricultural community is that they don't perceive this activity as actually addressing their conflict, and it's going to require their time and attention. And if we have legitimate conservation need, we need to supply on the southern grasslands. We're free to conduct this other work at our own leisure, at our own pace. Um, and also, there's the element of the delta dust, if we are doing relocations, mm -hmm. where uh, we're essentially, with this other policy, potentially forcing a leaseholder to accept delta dusting on their property. And so I offer the feedback that I've heard on that. So you're saying the sending sites should be non-leased, and the other leased sites should be perk treatment. I, I think we should focus um, the lethal control on leased agricultural land right. and focus the relocation on the non-leased mm -hmm. for the reasons of the pesticide and also for the simplicity of engagement with the lessees and reduced uh, coordination and administration time associated. Yeah. Now I understand. Thank you. Does staff see a big problem with that, or um, um, we had uh, stratified it by using techniques based on whether it's removal or transition area? Oh, Heather, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I, I think that's something that we can definitely look at. I haven't looked at it in that way to know how that would play out, but. Um, you know, I think in our prioritization factors that we discussed last time, making an impact to the most impacted lessees um, to minimize their conflict more quickly was, was one of the priorities. So we were kind of looking at it from that, that um, 100 acres of removal off those leased lands in one year might not be as good as 140 acres of removal off those leased lands in one year. But we could certainly shift that thinking and um, I, I, and, and I really do actually defer to the expertise of the people who've thought about this a lot longer, but I'm just communicating that I've heard from a number of lessees that they don't see the waiting period associated, the pesticides, and those other things as an, a, a direct addressing of what they are seeking. Hmm. And the, the only maybe um, question I would ask before you decide on something like this is, uh, uh, Mark, we just lost the... Um, the, the prioritization. Sorry, in our prioritization, one of the things that we heard very strongly from you was the, the defensibility. So let's do this where we don't have to come back in and do lethal control over and over again. And so in some instances, it may make sense to have, if we are doing 100 acres, but there's a 120 acre defensible area, we might want to do the 20 acres of relocation from that same unit, working with the lessees, making sure that, you know, the whole, the Delta dust thing is an issue that we need to investigate further ourselves. And we're being, we're, we're being instructed to do that by the state. And if there were options on that, we certainly would, would be welcome to them. But right now that, that is a constraint. So, um, so yeah, anyways, I would be looking for maybe some flexibility on this. I, and I, I, I wanted to just raise that issue because I heard I'm not wedded to this, and I, I re, there's a lot of nuance, and I, and I grant that. Um, but there, there are a lot of attractions for us doing that work on sort of our own land without having to interact with lessees. So, I, I think oh. it might be part of that uh, commitment that we've made to coordinate with the lessees. Mm -hmm. So if someone's an organic producer, they may have more concerns about the Delta dust because of the impact on their operations. So yep. again, I think that bearing that in mind <clears throat> is great. And I think it, 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 it folds neatly onto that. Uh, general idea of, you know, involving and consulting with the lessees. Yeah, so I, I think I'm where John was suggesting, that is, uh, I'm not opposed to sort of the concept of that Hal's elaborating, but I would retain the flexibility, because I think one of the things that's going to be important is you want to be able to go in and achieve enough 
in one mm -hmm. fell swoop, frankly, that you've got some, A, got some good, yeah, some scale, a big enough area that you can then barrier it off and you've accomplished something. And that if you're constantly saying, well, but I have to use this technique somewhere else, mm -hmm. we may limit our flexibility. And so I think working with the lessees may address Hal's concern while giving us some flexibility. Um, I think uh, that takes us to what I'll call the back end issues. I, I heard two. One was Dave's point about annual reporting, and the other was Karen's point about uh, what do we do beyond the three-year period. Are you leaving scale for last? Uh, well, I, partly I thought that was kind of embedded in what we had previously discussed, and uh, partly I thought that was going to be more of an omnibus um, motion. But if there's a specific tweak to the proposal on the scale issue. I just think it's such a critical question that we should probably talk about it. And I Oh yeah, I was just trying to okay. put it in the bucket. I'm No, I think it's fine to check off these more specific things first. Yeah. So whenever you're ready. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've got plenty of time. It's All right. So uh, Dave, your point about annual reporting, um, I think there's, a, that's already envisioned. Are there particular sort of elaborations that you'd offer on things you want the reporting to, sort of boxes to check? I think uh, that, that may be uh, the issue here. Yes, I, I think uh, w the community and the board needs to know specifically what the annual goals are, you know, the properties, the goals, and whether in fact uh, they've been achieved uh, during, you know, that uh, period of, of operation. And then what lessons are learned? You know, were, were, were they successful or not very successful? And, and would there be changes envisioned for the subsequent year? So these are um, elements of our annual Prairie Dog meeting that we committed to in the Prairie Dog Working Group recommendations, right. and that's why it wasn't included separately in here. But we can certainly um, put put this into the preferred alternative is that we would do these types of things in an annual uh, meeting to, that's available okay. to the community. Because I think, John, the, the, that three-year time frame initially, it, it, I mean, there, there have been some questions about why three years and not, you know, the whole nine years or 12 years or whatever it is. And I think the, a good explanation is like, you know, we're evaluating, you know, how effective these approaches are and whether in fact we need to be doing different ones or. Yep. I think Excellent. we may be able to uh, expand the text under number one to right. be more explicit about that. And I, I concur with Dave's a uh, suggestion that there be a consideration of adjustments at this time each year. All right. So I think it, it's important to have <clears throat> transparency. It's not just meeting with stakeholders, but actual reporting out to the public on, uh, I've made this point a few times, I think it's important to have annual reporting out to the public in a fairly simple form of, you know, what did we do? Yep. So that it's clear that there's monitoring an assessment and then, yeah, an adjustment if, if that's appropriate. Yep. So one of the key aspects, uh, Tom said we want to report on what we did. We'd also like to know how we're doing. <laughs> and so a question for staff is, how easy is it to know on an annual basis what the change is in acreage of an occupied ground in this area? We, we do annual inventories of occup areas occupied by prairie dogs. Okay, so that's something we plan to do every year. Yes. Yeah. Yep. They're all nodding. Okay. Yeah. I was hoping we could do it from satellite data, <laughs> like that, but okay. Good, thank you. Good, if we know the right people. All right, so Karen's point about planning beyond the three-year horizon. When I got to page 33, and it said, over the three-year period, an estimated 2.1 million will be required to implement the preferred alternative as presented, period. Mm -hmm. I said, and? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what happens after that? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it seems to me at least there ought to be a short paragraph that says, that perhaps comes back to w what Dave was just talking about and comparing it to the total goal 
and where we are at that point. And at that point, decisions will be made to how we proceed to achieve our goal of such and such. Okay. You get the idea. Yep. Yeah, I understand. Um, we really were not trying to limit the preferred alternative to that three-year period. We just have a difficulty projecting really accurately out beyond that. I understand. Yep. And in my opinion, there's difficulty in projecting year two. Absolutely. And year three. Yeah, you're right. So. Yep. Okay. So we'll clarify on that point. I got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, you're, are we all, oh, uh, Al? Clarifier on the funding reallocated from other pressing OSMP priorities. Um, with the potential removal of the conservation fund, how does that number change? It would be reduced by $3,000. Three hundred thousand. No, it would be one hundred and thirty thousand. Oh, three hundred thousand. Three hundred thousand. One hundred and thirty in the first. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So, so about it would be about a hundred thousand dollars a year that we would need to find from other priorities. So. Okay. Yep. Say say again which column would reduce how much? Just give me an. The column here. Yep. One hundred thousand a year would need to be reallocated into this effort from somewhere else, and it would actually be closer to two hundred thousand because it's not on the relocation acres. So it would just be the two years of lethal oh, control. Okay. Yep. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So it changes from two hundred thousand to, I mean, six hundred thousand to two hundred thousand. Um, to four hundred. Four hundred. So I think that is something we'll want to get into a discussion of. What do we want to do with the money we just saved? <laughs> Where do we want to put it? Because um, I'll argue that this problem's a lot bigger than we think it is, and it's growing a lot faster than we think it is. And so any savings sure. we do through not having a fund or not doing trapping, I will argue, should absolutely go right into the program itself. Um, so you want to treat the dollars as the sort of fixed target as a, as a minimum, programmatic. as a floor, is what I want to argue for, so. Right. Yeah. I want you to go to your... So I was going to ask, so the 200000 that uh, council gave this year? Um, yeah, in order so to fund the, a, a position, yes. Right. So is that reflected in this, in these numbers? It is not, because that was um, directed specifically for implementation of the Prairie Dog Working Group recommendations. Um, we already in our budget have the relocation um, budgeted in 2020, and the $200,000 is on top of that to implement the other Prairie Dog Working Group recommendations, and that's what that staff member is, is tasked with doing. And these do not fit within that, with the exception of the chunk that's relocation. So this would be new, different stuff above and beyond that. Can we uh, clarify that money's role kind of in whatever we convey to council? Because I think they're going to want to know, okay, you know, where does the money fit in that we just gave you? Yeah, we can definitely put a breakdown of what that money is all that earmarked for yeah. this year. Yeah. Because we may want to make the case that we need it for next year. I agree. <laughs> And I, I take Kurt's point. I'm also however, a little, more than a little concerned, I um, mean, we haven't discussed this at all, that we sit here uh, with a giant unknown about the state of our economy. Um, maybe what we're looking at is just going to be a blip in tourism, but we really don't know that. Uh, we may be looking at a fairly significant disruption that will hit our budget. Um, I believe, but correct me if I'm wrong, that the Long's Garden money is a minimum. That no matter how bad sales tax revenues come in, we've got to pay the 5.3. And so any savings would have to come out of some, some other bucket. At least that's how I remember that deal. Mm -hmm. I'm getting some nods. So, well, I mean, it's a pretty big chunk of our budget that we can't shrink. You know, we, right. they ha we have to spend 5.3 this year on Long's Garden, maybe more, but not less. And so I'm a, just, Yep. Want to be a little mindful that we've taken on a number of other things in the past several months that weren't cheap. Um, I thought the wording was up to. No, it's, uh, I believe it's it. 5.3 guaranteed. 
Matt Lynn. Um, I believe it's 5.3, and it would be above if sales tax collections went right, above. Right, but the 5.3 is, yeah. So if sales tax collection ended up at 4.8, oops, yeah, if you could bring that up. I, I don't want to, I, I have a, I have an idea of what it is, but I want to make sure. It's a different time. No, we don't. I, oh, okay. Well, and I, I think all of that gets built into the three-year review. I mean, if yeah. the yeah. trend lines on our economy are going in the tank, then we're going to cut back everything and revisit a lot of priorities. I think for at least this discussion, we assume sort of a status quo, and then you guys will have to adjust it. Right. So um, this is from Jul October 9th, 2019. This is from the memo. The minimum negotiated price is $5.3 million. If the amount collected is below the minimum price, the city will make up the difference from an existing funding source. And if it's above, then the sales price is now the above uh, yes. what we collected. And that's why we're not closing on the property into the first quarter of next year's, because if the sales collection came in at 5.5, that's the new sales price, mm -hmm. not 5.3 or. And if it comes in low, we got to make up the difference. Or the difference has to be made up. It has to be made up. <laughs> that's fine. I'll, use the, I'll use the yeah. passive voice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's a not less than 5.3, yeah. and it could be more. more. Right. It doesn't dictate it, it's out of the open space fund, but I wouldn't throw that out as either. Yes, I think that's fair. But but then the back to the Prairie Dog uh, preferred alternative, it's it's really, I think, number four that you're discussing and whether that should be an, an acreage goal or a funding goal was kind of what I was hearing maybe from Kurt. Number want, four where? Uh, number four here. Here, let me get a little bigger. So we, we had proposed that it that the amount of lethal control be based on an acreage amount, but what I was hearing is if you can get savings from other places, do more or and something along those lines. So I'm going to argue for that. You would need to know. Yeah. Uh, it, could we talk about scale for a minute? Yeah. No, I think we. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to the heart of the matter. Um, <laughs> Do you, we've heard people suggest that the growth rate's a lot higher than 3%. Do we feel highly confident that it's 3%? Heather? I feel absolutely confident that last year it was 3%. And that's Obviously, a, I don't have a crystal ball, but yeah. after plague, it tends to be a very rapid increase, and then it levels off over time, and we've seen the last three years it leveling off. And so last year it was 3%. Will that be what happens next year, I certainly can't say for sure, but that tends to be the pattern that we see. We might want to make that analysis a little more transparent by showing each year the changes in the growth rate, because that's kind of what I anticipated we would be finding is uh, a, an asymptotic sort of. Sure, yeah, and we've done that for a couple of years because the project area is a new spatial designation. Yeah, it takes yeah. all new analysis, so we have that system wide already for you know the last 20 years, um, but need to create it within the project area. So we've done that for the last few years, thinking that that was most instructive for what might happen yeah. next year and the year after, because um, many years ago we were just post plague, and we probably did have those 12, 15 percent growth rates, I'm sure. Um, that's how it tends to go when populations are very low, and then as density increases, those, those growth rates taper off. And do we think the density is staying fairly constant? I think density varies a lot from property to property. We don't yeah. count density because of the difficulty of doing it and the number of colonies right. that we have. Um, I think certainly post-plague, you start at low density and you move to higher density. Yeah. Um, some of our properties are probably at fairly high density. Some are at lower densities. Um, mm. I don't have a sense overall of, um, you know, certainly on those properties that are, are very hemmed in by um, real barriers on the landscape. I think right. you often do see fairly high densities, but that having been said, um, prairie dogs do have density dependent reproduction. And mm -hmm. so their reproduction does drop off a bit as their densities get very high. So yeah. that's somewhat self-modulating. So I, I raise this just because it's such a critical factor in projecting how long it's gonna take to do this and how much money it's gonna take and everything else. And so uh, the fact that we're monitoring the growth each year is really important. And I think we should just be a little careful about 
how we present this to council that we need to remind them that it is highly dependent upon growth rates. Um, it's what motivates me to say, and this gets back to your question, John, um, whatever money we can save, we should put right into the program because when you've got a growing population, any time you can get ahead of it, you're gonna actually save a lot of money and a lot of prairie dogs in the long run. So that's sort of my pitch for us not endorsing a fixed limit on your acreage, but sort of treat this as a base of funding and whatever you can do to increase the acreage and be more efficient, we absolutely are in favor of. And that includes seeking outside sources of funding. I know, Karen, you mentioned GOCO and whatever else we can do, I think we should chase down every buck we can get because the faster we start, the more robust our program is to other changes that we don't control. Okay. That's my speech, thank you. Well, I, one of the, uh, I'm probably in a slightly different place in that I don't view the goal of lethal control as getting to zero, per, you know, I would not kill down to zero prairie dogs on irrigated ag lands. I mean, I understand we want to get irrigated ag, that that's part of the goal is not to have prairie dogs in irrigated ag lands. But to me, that's different from saying, and we want lethal control to be the principal tool. A lot of these irrigated ag lands are like at 10, 11%. Which you know is it's not nothing, but it's certainly not the crisis that um, led to our motion last April that led to going to council in May. Was we said, well, there's a crisis that certain properties, some of which are leased, some of which are not, are you know either have sort of collapsed or on the verge of it because they're north of 50 percent. But a lot of these properties are you know as you've put up the numbers in the past, are in the 10 to 13 percent range. And, you know, I would not prioritize killing all of those prairie dogs so that something that's currently a 10 gets down to zero. To me, that's a much more situational judgment, um, looking at how those properties are doing, impacts on their neighbors, um, you know, what's the growth rate there. Uh, I would not say, just automatically say, well, any money we can free up we'll use to killing the prairie dogs, even if a plant a property's only at 5% anyhow. Does, does so that's yeah, maybe a difference of perspective, but I don't share the goal of just automatically killing all the prairie dogs. You know, I, I don't, that's overstating it, but I wouldn't. Yeah. Um, Are you addressing number five? We're confused about, are you saying, if we're going into a no, oh, okay. that's where removal is. Yes, I share that goal. That okay. if you've achieved okay. removal, keep it yeah. clear. Okay. That's different from saying if there's a property out there, and there are a lot of these that are say a 10% prairie dog occupation. To what extent should we use lethal control on those properties to get them down to zero? Okay. Lethal. Is that to me that is not the crisis that we brought to council's attention, and it was not the Can we pull that? Uh, the raison d'etre of this expedited process. I mean, it's an issue, and I think in the long run it ought to be resolved. But I didn't think um, that's why we're having this expedited process here. Okay, so um, Tom, then, isn't uh, what you're talking about the issue of priorities? Yeah, where you're going to prioritize. Well, yes, but it also goes to what do you do with any money that's freed up? Is it is it the automatic assumption that any money that gets freed up gets used to do more lethal control, or is that really governed by? Well, I maybe I didn't. I don't think I said lethal control. I said the program. Uh, whatever goal the program sets, the faster we get there, the fewer prairie dogs are going to be killed um, because of the growing population. So. Whether we set a goal for any particular property at 100% or 90%, it really doesn't matter. We're just saying our, our task is bigger than our resources right now. And so whatever we can save, I would put back into the program at least until we get a few years of data that says, oh, we're doing fabulously. Because I, yeah, okay. I don't think we're going to see that. Right. Within those time frames, I think I agree with okay. you. If those, but I wouldn't want to commit as a sort of, right now we've got some majorly impacted properties that we right. know are going to consume a lot of resources in the short term. We know that. Yeah. I, I just don't want to set as sort of a long run expectation that we're committing to getting everything down to zero. On every property. So, yeah, yes. I would agree. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and so 
this will be a line item in your in your budget when you see this and so every year if it doesn't seem like it's enough or if it's too much mm -hmm. you can also uh, use your your authority at that point to right. adjust it so. uh, on that uh, s sort of topic um, I, I kind of I, I agree with you um, we've we've kind of set zero as a goal because that is what the problem brought to us by the ag community has been however um, the real goal is to have our agricultural community come back to us and say, thank you, my operation is viable. Because the problem here is one after another has said, my operation is not viable due to the current constraints. I'm focused on people saying this is viable. I'm not focused on elimination of prairie dogs. And certainly we've heard a lot of testament that it's possible in some cases to work with it. But for those farmers who feel that it's completely uh, preventing them from via viability, I do think going to zero should be something that's done, uh, you, you know, in that consult. I bring this back to say the conversations and the public-private partnership in my mind is so important because the farmer will know better than anyone what a livable piece of ground is. And I trust, although some of them do want co complete elimination, some of them will be like, you know what, this this can live here, and then they'll talk to the department and they'll say, well, it can't actually be there because that impacts this other person over here. But in some cases, maybe they say, well, deprior deprioritize this zone. So it's not about mm -hmm. chasing things to zero, but the, the, the thing that I am hearing is that for viability to occur, we can't play any games where we're below the growth rates going on out there because now it's just kabuki theater. And I think the degree to which we can, down the road, give our lessees tools to manage populations, then it's gonna be a lot easier for them to handle the carryover or the de minimis uh, occupations and we won't have to be, you know, every year us going out trying to get it to zero if they have some tools. So, uh, is everyone, okay? I mean, they might, we might art articulate that with a little bit different spin and emphasis, but is everybody at least broadly okay with that idea? Yes. No, no one will ever agree. Except that I have two remaining questions. And one has to do with my unease with the lack of knowing what properties were talking about which properties in the universe within that line meet our definitions of the properties that we're prioritizing and and I know that's not going to come tonight but I I thought I heard you say that was going to come so if you knew that list of properties how might that change your policy decision here then, then I thought when we started this a little less than a year ago, we used a number and we said the reason why this is an emer emergency is because we've got so many properties above and I thought we'd use 35%. Is that a... No. So we have set a number that's above zero, so to speak. At the same time, I agree with Hal's definition of it's got to be a viable operation. So the, the way we structured this was to focus on transition and removal areas first, no matter what percentage they were on. We were saying since, those, since we have guidance in the grassland plan and the ag plan and elsewhere to focus on those areas, that's where we would start. I would say if if your if your question about which properties is trying to get at what's in the grassland preserve and the prairie dog conservation areas and multiple multiple use areas, and those are not areas that we're going to be removing from, right? Not immediately. Um, that would be something we would look at down the line. So, if if knowing where those properties are would help you would would change what you want to do with respect to transition and removal areas and moving some other areas up in line, then that that we could try to describe where those different areas are using the maps that Mark has here. But if um, if if you if your intent is to do 
transition and removal areas first, I would say we've got a lot of work to do before we ever get to a discussion of some of those other areas. Okay, and the ones that are above 50% are transition and removal areas? Uh, Andy, do you have a sense of, or, yeah. Yeah, the leaseholds that are above 50% do include some transition and removal areas. One more than other, but um, they do include land of that designation. Okay, and I guess my question for the board is, is 35% still a meaningful number to us? So are you, are you saying that if it's outside of a transition or removal area and it's over 35%, you would want that addressed before transition and removal areas that are, um, that are lower than 35%? I, I, can I just throw in here, I, I, I really am with you in many ways on this, but I just want to be careful to, of micromanaging. I have great faith in the prioritization process, and so I, I'm ready to focus in on the, the high-level decision, which is where's the funding and... Mm -hmm. All right. That, that's what I was going to say. And is, that, and is that transparent enough for the public <laughs> to understand what we're doing? That's my concern. Well, annually we'll be providing specific information about you know, what, what we're proposing to do. We'll be working with uh, the neighbors, we'll be working with the lessees on these various projects. There are a lot of um, prioritization criteria. There's a lot of kind of overlays on the prioritization criteria. They're also um, in working with neighbors and, and, and lessees going to be the need for some flexibility to make things work, I'd say. Okay. So I think by the time we're in a position to describe what it is that we're doing on the ground, that's, you know, when we'll know, and that's when we'll be in a position, you know, to share that specific information. And I would say there are a lot of limiting factors um, that really influence what you choose. So colonies don't come in neat packages of yeah. 100 acres either. Yeah. So you may have a 160 acre colony, which is at very high occupation, and it might not make sense to remove 100 acres of that in one year because that really doesn't tick off our top prioritization of actually being able to keep them out. And so we'd want to figure out a strategy for a property like that right. that might not mean it's the first lethal control priority in year one to hit, so we're gonna have to factor that stuff in too so that everything that we do is actually something we feel like we can keep them out of and defend and actually have be a gain instead of just a temporary s setback of the prairie dog numbers. Yeah. I think like Hal, I view the, the property level decision as more of an implementation. We've given you the, we've described the tools, we've described the overall scale of this and the criteria to prioritize how you apply that and negotiate that with the lessees, I think is um, in your good hands. So, so I agree with that, but John, I think, and we've talked about this previously, I think if we can get a map, and again, I'm thinking of, of council, but the community as well, if we can get a map that shows the transition and removal areas and the grassland preserves, so people get a, can look at the system in context and say, oh, well, here's where, you know, prairie dogs are okay and they're living, and here's where we're gonna start targeting uh, removal or whatever. I think that will help clarify uh, some of the uncertainty or confusion. Okay. And the definitions but, that we talked about earlier. But do you need that before you make a decision tonight, or, or is that something we no, need to No, no, I, I'm okay with just, what Hal said, yeah, yeah. But I think for council especially, there's gonna be this, you know, what, oh, where is all this? What are you this? talking about? I got gotcha. you, right. okay. We, we can certainly show that, you know, where the efforts are being made to conserve, yeah. where, where prairie dogs would be relocated to, where the grassland preserves are, things like that. Great, okay. And and show where prairie dogs are occupying irrigated fields right. within the project area on top of the management area designation. And if you can associate approximate populations with each of those categories, I think that also helps educate council. You mean? Okay. Numbers of acres? Uh, I'd say prairie dogs. I mean, yeah. Yeah. there is a big concern and a legitimate concern that if we remove, I don't know, 30,000 prairie dogs, that we're going to put a significant dent in our ability to help conserve the species. And I think 
we see numbers differently than that that suggest that the total occupation on open space lands is over half a million, probably. Um, so I think we can do that at a very broad level. Very like I said, density is very broadly, and yep. within these heavily populated irrigable ag lands, I think they vary less. And so I think that 30 might be a little bit above, might be a little bit below, but I think it's pretty good. When you go to southern grasslands where at really low populations, it's probably eight per acre. And so right. as you go system wide, that variability and density just gets enormous. And I'm not sure how, it, how helpful the numbers are. I think all we're trying to do is communicate the best that we know about what is the population of black-tailed prairie dogs in our open space lands. And then what fraction of that are we really talking about uh, removing? We just need to know on orders of magnitude. Because the board is hearing a lot of words like extinction and extermination and things yes. like that. And we, we, we got to put this in the realistic context for the council especially. Right. So I think acres still still puts that picture. I mean, what percentage of our acres are we talking about in this? And that's actual data that we have, right? We don't have to put huge error bars around that, like orders of magnitude okay. or worse right. error bars, because mm -hmm. we just don't have the information to go off of. So I think we can paint that picture using the actual data that we measure, which is the acres occupied. And if okay. it's your And you're judgment. talking about acres for each of the five categories? Certainly. Yeah. However, I mean, however you want us to slice it. I've, right. I've got acres by the, the management designation system wide within the study area. We've got it by protected status versus non-protected status. I mean, we've got all those numbers. We've, we've prepared them all for the October open house okay. and have slides so, of most of them. So they're all there. Yeah. Right. So it feels like we're transitioning from specific suggestions or changes to sort of context setting. And you know, look, it's almost, it's, you know, we're going to hit the wall pretty soon. And so I would just say, can I just, are there any other changes to the plan that people want to discuss? Well, we haven't solved the funding issue, which strikes me as the most critical piece. Oh. And my only question is, before the funding is that we haven't talked about soils and soil health at all. Do we, are there any issues around that that we need to discuss? Because there was a lot of, public pushback on that in terms of, well, that's not a prairie dog problem, it ought to be separate. C can I attempt to tie the, those two things together and we'll see how far I get? Okay. <laughs> um, in, in my mind, what this is about is a balance of a number of things. First off, I am convinced that agriculture has a well-deserved place in our charter, that food security, especially presently today, occurs to me as more important than ever. I do not believe the future vision of our open space system is essentially a ring of wilderness with a bunch of computer programmers in the middle. I believe <laughs> in, in a diversified, I, I believe in the charter vision. I believe it was beautifully constructed. I believe it honors multiple ways of life. And the question for me only is, given that we'd like to help those who lease irrigable, irrigable ag lands who say their leases are not viable as fast as possible, respecting the constraints of our budget. So I, I, in, in, in their job helping us with soil uh, carbon sequestration, we'll look very silly if we end up with no farmers talking about soil carbon. We know that much. So I, I would like to look at the, the dollar slide and just for us to have the hard conversation of what is the number we want to see on the annual budget going forward. And also to really, for me, the important thing you mentioned about the annual reporting, the reason the annual reporting is important to me is because I want to know we have the flexibility. If, if As soon as we drop below the 26 top end and there's a downward trend, we should be in here talking about what rollback or additional protections are going to go into place to maintain that population. That's the key thing is that we can jump out to save a keystone species when it's really next tough. So. That, that encapsulates my overall view on, on, on this. And so we came to a place where we, we found 400,000 would be reallocated from other people, excluding the, uh, given that the conservation fund was rolled into that. So a total cost of uh, 2.1 million, um, potentially with an allocation of 200,000 more to uh, lethal control measures, 
people can see on the annual cost referring back to the original slide we got that had all the packages. Um, You're talking about table four or whatever table it is? Five. five. Yep, table five. Um, for, for me, it really just amounts to what dollar amount can we live with for three years on that line item, respecting uh, all of our other concerns. I, I kind of feel like I'm certainly comfortable with the number shown. I am comfortable with the general reallocation of, of the money saved into moving towards effectiveness towards our agricultural community. Um, but I, but I, I really am curious what your opinions are on that side of things too. It's the, the, I also, one last thing, um, I'm really looking forward to the retreat where we're gonna talk about the overall maintenance budget and the shift to maintenance. It feels like making a decision a little in the dark here without seeing like what the broader context is. Cause I'm thinking in my mind, we're saving some money on acquisitions potentially. Um, in the future, but I really don't have a clear view of what we're saving and how it's reallocated. So th this, I respect that it's really hard to figure what that number, what a sustainable number looks like there. Um, anyway, I t I, my, my intuition from looking at previous numbers tells me we can, we can do this. Yeah. We may be able to do a little more. One of the reasons why staff does offer a recommendation is we probably wouldn't put forth a recommendation we feel like we couldn't yeah. do in good conscience with respecting our, our resource capacity. So certainly this fed into what you're seeing tonight is something that we felt is doable. Yep. And those don't <laughs> reflect the savings from reduced trapping for raptors. Correct. Okay. It was a decent amount of money, um, yeah. over at least over right. a three-year period, and, uh, and more <clears throat> money from the, that was allocated to the fund. Yep. And less money for the other twenty acres. Where was that? So, is it? Again, back to the acreage, the scale thing. If if we go back and sharpen our pencils, would would it be to increase the acreage of lethal control up to a budget in this neighborhood, or something else? That I see head nods. Uh, or is it to reduce the reallocated funding amount, right, and keep the targets the same? It, in some ways, you're in a better place to advise us on that. I, I think I would keep the reallocated the same, just because I want to get a fast start on this in the first three years, and then we can see if we're making progress. But I think at this point, I would advise to maximize our allocations as much as we can. Keep it at 2.1 million, roughly, and see how that translates into the other, yeah. into the specific activities and and I think again we've said that we want to do the relocations that we need to support prairie dog conservation and that can be absorbed beyond that we we think we're telling you just be as efficient as you can to make progress towards the goal Hal said of restoring viability of operations but but in that context I think the you know I think the board needs to know where the reallocated funding is proposed to come from. And so I, I would tend to agree with you, Kurt, but I guess if it looks like other programs are really going to be hit uh, because of the reallocation, then I think the board should know that and have some uh, you know, contribution as far as whether that's okay. And we can come back during our funding conversations right. and let you know how it all, right. how it, it did play out. Right. Well, or maybe, or maybe at our April meeting before it goes to council. I mean, uh -huh. I, I think what you're saying, Dave, is what are we not going right. to be able to do because we've transferred it here? Right. 
right? So as you recall, when we recommend, you know, we have a very robust work planning. Yep. Uh, we're wrapping up our internal CIP staff recommended list, and we'll have some projects that are below the line that, we're, that we've decided to either defer, scale back, or, def um, or not take on based on what our priorities, we felt our priorities were worth matching to the uh, master plan. And that's what we'll share. And so if you see something that's below the line that didn't get funded for one reason or another uh, from this and other priority selections, that would be a way for you to raise some concerns about a project that is either scaled back or deferred. Um, right. I, I, as a potential <clears throat> way forward, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I can run with you, Kurt, on a rollback in at 2.1 million over three years, knowing you're exactly right. When you buy something, you're selling something else. Right. But we'll know that at the next budget meeting, we'll get a clear view. And, and when we get the budget, you can all, we can always review this at that time after we go forward, correct? Right, and you, and you won't be seeing that specificity in April. April is the light touch, which we go over the process, and then every month after that, we'll, we'll, you'll start to get more details. I, I'm fairly confident, Karen, that you're, this is a tier one project, that you're not going to see another tier one project mm -hmm. hammered over the head because okay. of this allocation decision. It's probably going to be a tier three or a tier two project that maybe didn't get the funding based on the amount of money we had available to fund our tier one. So one, one sort of guiding thing we, we did this year with after we funded our top priorities, we then said, okay, here's some money left over. We put 80% of that towards tier one projects and only 20% towards tier, and two, tier two and three in order to get a really heavy start on tier one. And this is a tier one. So I doubt you're gonna be concerned about what maybe got left off the table in relationship to this project. That's helpful, thank you. Okay, so uh, I think unless someone else has another change to the preferred alternative, we've reached agreement on that. And I guess the question now, uh, people may have other motions they want to float. Um, but my inclination would be, since we've agreed on this, would be to make this a standalone motion. And then uh, if there are other things, other motions people have to do them separately. Uh, are we calling the, the revisions that we've made tonight verbally revisions? I would just say the preferred alternative as amended. As amended. As amended. As amended. As amended. The usual okay. at this and, meeting. And uh, if you want me to uh, summarize those for you, I can. Otherwise, we can so, just get it from mm -hmm. the conversation. Yeah. So. so, Tom, uh, let me just throw this thought in. Uh, we had talked about maybe adding language that would make it clear that we want them to exercise flexibility, that we, while we like almost everything we're seeing in the plan you put forward and all the findings and everything else, so I'll read you language and see what you think about it. While the OSBT endorses the preferred alternatives in general concept, we are not committed to its specific numbers. We view the figures as a useful guideline which should be adjusted adaptively based on new information, resources, and experience. So that's just a concept. Now, maybe what we're saying is what we are fixed on is a level of funding. But the specific targets within the program, if they need to be adjusted based on experience, blah, 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 we're not saying, no, you have to hit that number. That, that was the sort sure. of intent of, of that language. I don't know if we still think it's needed, but that was the idea. I'm, I'm fine with me. Wild enthusiasm. I think, I think we'll get that in our annual reports and adjustments, I, don't we? I think that's fine. I just know that, you know, we have hard numbers for different things here, and are we setting up an expectation that, you know, it, it will be exactly this number? I don't think it will, and I think we're just acknowledging that we're 
wanting to give tactical and some strategic flexibility to the department as they move forward. Uh, I mean, we know, for example, the first year is going to be a, a, a gear up year, and, it's, right. and we're not going to come anywhere near these numbers that we have on paper. So, but even years two and three are going to be different because of the decisions we made tonight. <clears throat> Oh, right. Um, well, are you wanting to change the targets then? Oh, yeah, that was what I was assuming, that we were changing the target based on the funding level that we talked about. Well, and based on the decisions of what we were going to do and not do. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Which, mm -hmm. which, raises, which yeah. increases the funding yeah. or makes funding available differently. It reallocates some of the money within this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm comfortable I'm, I'm with fine. the motion as it is. I, the, the only thing for me is the real crux is getting the legal work done right because it was the legal work that put us in this bind in the first place. And so in my magic, but I, maybe I'll write a, a letter of my own on that. I, that's the key part. Yeah, I don't not here, but. Okay. I'm good. Do we want to put as amended in there? Right. We need to put as needs amended. needs to say as amended. Preferred alternative. As amended. as amended. Right. All right. Well, so who wants to? I don't care. Uh, yeah. I'm happy to take this one. Okay. You guys owe me. Yeah. <laughs> Next acquisition. Um, You're going to get South Boulder Creek. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, what a deal. Okay. Yeah. I move the Open Space Board of Trustees to make a motion to recommending the City Council approve the preferred alternative as amended for the management of irrigated agricultural fields on city managed open space and mountain park lands occupied by prairie dogs in the project area. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Done. Okay. So I think that's a wrap on. Item four, Prairie Dogs. Um, so, let's see, matters from the board. The first uh, upcoming events, we, the only one that uh, we've been notified of, and by the way, I wanted to thank everyone. I, I should stop before I move on yeah. to administrative stuff. I want to thank everyone both for uh, an incredibly helpful set of comments in person and by email over a sustained period of time for attending and participating in our events for your patience in sitting here tonight on, a, as I say again, the difficult night and it's been a fairly long discussion. We know it's a difficult issue and no one is gonna get all that they would wish. Um, but, um, you know, I think you saw a board that took its responsibilities and information seriously and did the best that we could. Um, and then it's up to City Council to see what they wish to do with all of this. But thank you again. Um, so with the... Can I... Sure. You, since, okay. since I did the motion, can I have one comment? I also just want to really celebrate the work of the Prairie Dog, wor the Prairie Dog Working Group we have um, exceeded targets relative to the grassland plan. And I expect after this work is conducted, hopefully we're gonna have happy farmers in the community and a continued growing prairie dog population in total. So I, um, I, I really uh, appreciate all the hard work that is done on that. All right, thank you. So uh, we have an open house for Wonderland Lakes ISP on April 6th. Uh, from 5.30 to 7.30 um, at the Hub. Um, can I just get a quick nod to designate that as a meeting of the Open Space Board? Yes, and just to, we're in shifting sands in a changing environment every day. We're learning more and more yeah. about the impact yeah. to public events. And so we are thinking about and preparing how uh, that engagement period could be something other than a large gathering as well. So we're gonna, we're developing an alternative in case we need to move that way. So I just wanted to let you know on that. And for those, and some of you probably know this, but for those who don't, uh, I think the city manager's office is bringing to the CAC on Monday, sort of kicking off the question of sort of more broadly at council and probably other meetings, how to engage the public without having to physically be present, but that's, 
Yep, we're expecting that's down the road. That's down the road. We're probably not very far down the road. Not very far. It's uh, uh, how to engage the public, and this time is is very active conversation, and we should actually have some uh, specific things in place for next. Start. If only there were some high tech skill in this community. <laughs> um, do you need any other business on the next uh, One other quick announcement. Uh, I was just going to, that's all I had. Any other matters from the board anyone wants to raise? Uh, so, Dan, I, I just uh, want to let you know I'm concerned about the status of the El Dorado Canyon Visitor Use Management Plan. And I, I'm concerned about the role of our staff in the whole development of that plan. And my primary concern is that, you know, the focus on the proposed trail is largely on open space property mm -hmm. and I'm just concerned that we well I'm, the question in my mind is have we as a staff participated sufficiently in that process so that you know in subsequent steps uh, we're confident that the concerns that I think the board has expressed previously and the staff probably has will be addressed and I the concern I have is that it will the staff is the staff sufficiently involved in the development of the draft plan that there'll be a kind of pre-release review by staff of of the plan so that before it's publicly released that you know there's uh, some contribution from the staff and hopefully by extension uh, the board can kind of you know get some sense of uh, what's in the draft plan as well well um, we're looking to get clarification as far as the specific dates and timelines what we are thinking of doing and one of the reasons why we're going to be manipulating a little bit this quarter two board meetings is we are expecting to have a conversation with you in May now which wasn't on the draft based on what we think is going to be landing as in terms of the opportunity for the board to provide feedback and so we are expecting May would be that time period um, how much time staff would have prior to the community uh, for the total plan, that is still an outstanding question. We, as of now, we're, we're, we're not hearing that there's going to be a staff-only time uh, uh, or an agency-specific time to do a review outside of when, they, when the parks release the plan. So the three agency partners uh, in, in your kind of uh, thinking are not going to kind of get a pre pre release look at uh, the draft plan we're looking for clarification on that okay. right now it's as you know the meetings have i think there's been a five meetings and they've been sort of subject right. specific meetings not a, a full coalesce of here's the plan kind of conversation but we could you know we're we're trying to get more information we'll learn more and we can provide you another feedback in march 30th as far as i think when we think that exact timeline is going to land and what what kind of conversation do we expect to have with you in may and what you would like to expect to have in may my feeling is that trail is kind of moving down the road, you know, kind of tangentially to the plan. And I'm just concerned that, you know, the the role of the open space department in, you know, evaluating, you know, the proposed trail alignment uh, has not been as uh, robust and extensive as it uh, needs to be. Okay. And so, and so I'm, I'm concerned that we not get so far down the road that then it becomes a, a, a very awkward situation that, you know, that we're, we the board are, you know, kind of saying, well, wait a second. Um, so I want to make sure we as, have some assurance that the environmental impact, you know, valuations and assessments are, are adequate and, you know, being conducted as, as they need to be. And this would be from the state parks perspective. Then there's the whole next step because we have, the board has given us direction that if 
if it's still a viable option for us to even consider, we need to come back to the board right. with much more analysis, and you gave us a specific motion of what you would like right. more information on. So the most, and this is my perspective, the most that the Vump El Dorado Canyon State Park plan would say about it would be as whether or not it's still on the table for the agencies to do their further consideration and to come back. So, okay. Um, it, 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 it's possible it could be removed from consideration through the VUMP plan, okay. but it, it would not be approved because that would necessitate, uh, the trail would necessitate the board's recommendation um, uh, okay. from our perspective, in well, which there's a lot of work to be done. If we could get an update on, you know, on whatever uh, the status is at the March 30th sure. meeting, I think that would be uh, very helpful. Sure. I'll admit I was confused too. I, I thought when the trail was tabled by the park, they were basically saying, we want to do a visitor use master plan first. And that would be basically done before a decision was made about the trail being picked up again. But it does seem to be getting out of sequence. So. I'm gonna Again, our expectation, and we're not the leaders on that, yeah. we're a participant, but uh, is that whatever comes out of that plan is not going to be an approval of a trail. It's, it, it could leave the door open for further right. consideration right. of the trail, which would then necessitate our department and our staff picking things up from where we left off a year or so ago right. and to come back and continue to work with this board and continue to work on the direction you gave us to, to pursue. The other, the other thing that we see that could come out of it is that based on state park specific issues, they may feel like don't bother coming back to us. And, and that could be something come out of it. But we're not seeing uh, uh, an alternative coming out of this plan and saying the trail is approved, you know, pen, pending OSBT recommendation. I mean, it's, right. it's not gonna go that far. It, it, we're seeing it as it would only go as far as saying it's still a possibility pending on the agencies coming coming back to us with their full recommendations. Well, if we could get a quick update, sure. Uh, then I think that'd yeah. be real helpful. Sure. I, I thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and the other thing that concerns me, I, I I really appreciate OSMP pulling out of the shuttle operation. Because I, one of the other things that this whole VUMP process conjures up in my mind is the concerns that we have expressed in the master plan about visitor use mm -hmm. and numbers and, and heavy use of our system ever increasing. And so the increased use in Dowdy Draw and South Mesa Trail in those areas, from what I've read, may very seriously be impacted by what's decided by the VUMP. So that's another part of the issue for me. Right, we need to be prepared and we are getting prepared with a lot of good data in order to know what our baseline numbers are. And so if we decided to employ a strategy for a year as a trial or what, whatever the strategy is, whether it's shuttle or something else, we definitely would wanna know what, would, what was the impacts, positive and negatives, to that decision, and we can only know that if we had sufficient background right. data. Right. And uh, luckily, we have an HD Humans Dimension staff and other efforts going on that has given us that great baseline data. But I would say is, uh, you know, when it comes down to increase, managing increasing visitation, is, is there's a lot of strategies in the menu that you can employ, and we may decide collectively to employ a few on a pilot basis, and then we would wanna measure whether or not that was good or bad. As you know, we decided to implement a pilot uh, shuttle program at the camp, and what we found initially is that the numbers actually decreased a little bit. Not to say that that's the trend all the time, but it's, it's not a foregone conclusion that whenever we implement something, it's always gonna be an increase in that visitation. So we wanna, but we, but we need to back that up with numbers. Right. And in, in uh, environmental impact assessment as well. Sure. Yeah, so sure. There, there's a multi pronged uh, need, I think, here. Yep. All right. Al, just yeah, a brief one. I, I thought this was outside of the scope of tonight's conversation, sure. but um, for me, one of the things I was convinced on in phone calls with a variety of stakeholders here is that a key part of the Prairie Dog Working Group's 
uh, implementation has to do with our lease selection into the future. And for me personally, um, I, I, I look forward to following that more closely um, to, to see, you know, I, I do believe what I was told that there are different types of operations that can coexist better, more har harmoniously. Um, I know that wasn't sort of built into our current criteria, but nonetheless, they made compelling arguments for why that's a key part of the, the future of the, the group. Mm -hmm. Comment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one announcement. Um, uh, today, it's, it, we, it's been decided that the tribal consultations have been postponed. Uh, we've, uh, late this afternoon, we informed the tribal nations uh, tomorrow you'll be getting official notice and the council will be getting official notice to that effect, but uh, as long as it's almost tomorrow. So uh, I thought I'd just give you a heads up on that. we got another hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs> Not surprising. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. And we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Live from Paris, on France 24.